I'm Ankwa Asante, the CEO of Frame Images. We are so excited to have you all join us today. We just want you to sit back and relax as we get ready to start our event for the day. Please enjoy this countdown as the event begins.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I go by the name of DJ Earthquake. We are here to have a phenomenal time. Our brother Yao has written an excellent book called The African Elephant. We are going to have a grand old time, great conversation, but we're going to start off with some good vibes, and we're going to start off with old school first. Again, I go by the name of DJ Earthquake. Here we go. I give you the first thing you go for. They can talk you something now. Say, yeah, go, go. Go, 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 go. Let me see I'm not down. Go, 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 go.
It's about to be lit, okay? A couple house rules. We want you guys to be engaged. That means if you're on social media, use hashtag the African elephant. Stay tuned on YouTube. Drop some comments in the chat section. Let us know that you're with us, that you're vibing with us. And we're just, we're going to have fun. We have so many guest ministers tonight. We have none other than the minister, Joe Metal. We have some comedy from Skinny Man. Like, I'm elated. Like, tonight is going to be bomb like y'all would say tonight is tonight so if you're ready please put some fire emojis in the group chat i have none other but the man of the hour 
the birthday guy, the author, the minister, the deacon, the titles are endless. Like, God has really favored this man tonight. It's his birthday and his book launch. Somebody say, hey, like, double the favor. Listen, next year, by this time, may we be tuning into your birthday and your book launch. Somebody say amen. Amen? Amen. But please, wherever you are, I hope that you're excited and ready. We want to welcome the man of the hour. We have none other than Minister Yao Osei Owusu. Come on, throw some clapping emojis. Hey, hey, come on, come on, smooth guy. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yao, I'm so excited for you tonight. Yeah, man. I'm I was telling somebody I'm, I'm nervous and excited at the same time. Like, like it's, you know? it's double the blessings. Amen. 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 It is, it is. But I hope you guys are ready. We just want to say a quick word of prayer. So wherever you are, please bow your heads with me. Close your eyes as we dedicate this night into the hands of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed our brother tonight. Lord, we ask that on tonight that your favor, your goodness, your mercy will go before us. We're asking that whoever is tuning in tonight, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will give each and every person a word that is dedicated specifically for them. We pray that you will renew our minds and transform our thinkings concerning church, concerning culture, concerning life, Lord, that we will align ourselves to your perfect will. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you tonight, and we ask that you would have your way. We ask that you would wreck us, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would have that you would have us come to encounter you in a way that we wouldn't expect. Lord, have your way, take control, be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said a big amen. 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 Y'all, look, I was so I was so pressed for my copy of the African Elephant. Like, look at all my notes in here. Listen, tonight is going to be awesome. Please get ready. Stay tuned. We're going to be making donations to support the book. And everyone who makes a donation tonight is getting a personal autographed book. It is going to be awesome. Like, listen, I, I just, like, I need y'all to be ready because the way I'm excited, like, listen, I already got my, my autograph in here. I was pressed. Like, I was pressed. But we're going to have an awesome time. Y'all, congrats again. Thank you. Thank you. Really. We see this, like, we saw that you are on, on Instagram, right, and you were doing, like, the elephant in the room, the elephant in the room. We were like, hmm, something, something's cooking because the captions were too, yeah. they were too insightful. Yeah. What made you um, write the African elephant? What inspired it? Um, so what inspired it was that I've, I've gone to, and I've been a part of the African diaspora church ever since I was born. Mm -hmm. So I was born um, in London, England. And I was born into a Baptist church. My parents got converted into Christianity in a Baptist denomination. Mm -hmm. So we left London and we came to America at the age of seven. And then we left the Baptist church and we went to another African diaspora church, which is a Ghanaian church. Okay. For anybody who's in Virginia, if you're from Virginia, drop something, in the, uh, you know, in the comments. Oh, my highway, Bucknell Road, you know, uh, <laughs> Mount Vernon, <laughs> VA people. You know, um, well, the thing is, we... Went to church in Virginia, yeah. um, and it was a charismatic church. So okay. we moved from Baptist, Baptist to charismatic. Correct. And then later on, when I turned about between 17, 18, I joined a classical Pentecostal church, which is the church I go to now. Any church of Pentecost people in the house where you at? Boo, boo. We know they're in there. <laughs> <deep. laughs> I'm sure they're in there. But I went to um, a, a classical Pentecostal church. So I've been to three different um, African diaspora denominational churches, wow. and I've still kept a very good relationship with these churches. Yes. So I've noticed something that, like, we all go to college. Mm -hmm. You know, started with my brother's age group. They'll go to college, and they really wouldn't kind of come back to church. Mm -hmm. They would actually maybe some will stay in the faith and go to another church. Or um, some will kind of step away from the faith altogether. Then when I went to college and I came back, I noticed people would, you know, go experience another church and realize there's something out there that they want to experience, mm -hmm. which is outside of the African mm -hmm. diaspora church. So I've noticed that it's bothered church leaders as well. When we go to conferences, youth camps and stuff, they're like, how can we keep the young people in? And I always felt like there were a lot of, surveys and a lot of like um, like programs to 
let's talk about it. But right. we never really did anything about, about it, it, right? Mm. So I felt like this has been bothering me for years. And I talk about it. If you meet me, I talk about this a lot. Yes. So I said, why don't I just write okay. about it? Wow. So I wrote a book and I was like, look, you know, I ain't even the best writer, but I'm just going to write because I feel like this is something that can bless a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I came up with it. So what I was doing on Instagram was just throwing stuff out there like, yo, there's different things that are elephants in the room. People, somebody asked me why the African elephant. Yeah. And it's there because this, it's an elephant in the room. People know it's there, but they don't want to talk about it. Because when leaders have to talk about why young people are leaving, they also have to look at themselves, That's what they're good. doing wrong. That's good. So, they, so sometimes when that happens, they're kind of like, yeah, we know what's happening, but nobody's going to talk right. about it. And we come from a culture that doesn't like to be transparent about our er errors, our faults, our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So everybody's like, we're not going to talk about it. But I feel like, man, it's time to talk about it. Not just talk about it. It's time to do something about it. And then there needs to be solutions about it so that right. we can do something right. else. So, yeah. That's good. And I like that you touch on the transparency. We're going to get into that in a bit. But when did you when did you really decide, okay, you know what? I'm going to write the book now. Because like you said, it's something that you're passionate about. You talk about it a lot. When was that deciding factor for you? And who did you write this book for? Okay. So that's a good question. So... I always tell people I spent a lot of time in God's presence this year, um, last year going into this year. And I believe that whenever I get an idea and an inspiration, it can only come from one place, mm -hmm. from the Holy Spirit. If I'm spending time with him, whatever comes out of me within the days when I'm living my life yes. and I get an idea, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes. So I saw that the quarantining or like the time where we had to... Um, be at home, we were all locked down. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is the perfect time because if I don't write it now, many people will be gone without the solutions needed to keep people in. Yeah. So it was written for uh, everybody. A lot of people keep saying, man, this book is for the pastors. This book mm -hmm. is for our mom and dads need to hear this. And mm -hmm. I'm like, hold on. There's something that you got to do as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a chapter in the book that's called um, How Can Millennials Be the Bridge? I always tell people, when you are the bridge, it means that people are going to walk on you. People from two different directions. One will come from this direction. I see that as my parents' generation. Yes. And then I see other people from another direction, which is my generation. And they may step on you, but they need to so that they can both meet and bridge that gap. So I felt like in my life, I'm still in the African denominational church. And this book gives tips to my generation. This is how I've been able to help my church. That's good. And then also, I felt like the African church is beautiful. It's a great uh, church. The kingdom of God. Let's just talk about the kingdom of God. It's beautiful. Yes. But we all come from different places, right? And there's a spirituality. There's a family sense that we have in this church. But I noticed it was little petty things mm. that caused people to come out. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to draw attention to my moms and dads and pastors and leaders about the small petty things that if we don't catch them quick, yeah. they become yeah. elephants and they come become on. big. So I'm like, hey, let's deal with this. Now, let's talk about it now. now. Let's find the solutions now. And let's let the church of God grow now. Amen. Amen. That's a word already. But I noticed that you also had a foreword by Dr. Frank Afosu Apia. Yeah. Amazing My foreword. Um, what, what made you get the foreword from him? Yeah. So, for... When I was born, where I had my baby dedication, yes. he was actually there wow. in London. From so the he was beginning. There from the beginning. Wow. He was there in my dedication. When I moved to America, he would come and visit the church I was attending in Virginia. Okay. Okay. Um, so he got to see me a lot. When he was in Atlanta, I used to go be with him. Um, and he's been a great source of help. But he's also been a pastor in Ghana, London, and America. Oh, wow. So he also kind of has that, that uh, different point. diaspora churches. So right. I felt like he can give us the point of view from Europe, the point of view from Ghana, Ghana. Europe, um, point of view from Atlanta, Georgia, which is in America. So I felt he would be the best person to kind of give us uh, a forward about this issue that has been plaguing the church for just it hasn't started now it's been here for a minute years yeah guys and this is just a foretaste like it is going to get better but really quick we want to um give a shout out to cosmo portals tonight for sponsoring this yep, event yep, cosmo 
please, if you have a business, a small business, a mid-sized range business, Cosmo Portals is your person for your all your IT situations. That's they right. say that they let you do what you do best and let the engineers handle the rest, okay? That's so right. please, if you are on Instagram, if you're on social media, please follow at Cosmo Portals. Awesome. Yes. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a part in this book yeah. that I felt like... Nah, like I, I need, we need to talk about this part tonight. Yeah. And you were talking about culture, um, and you went on to say uh, injecting culture into the church in an illegitimate manner can po pose a problem, as the church is a culture which stands on its own. Joining with other cultures can create an almost robotic entity. And I really wanted to talk about culture because I'm like, you know what? That's true. Like church in a in of itself already has a culture, has Correct. a vibe. You know, like things that we do that are socially acceptable and not and then when you bring African culture into it you know you have a new set of like do's and don'ts and one thing that you mentioned a lot was um, when uh, students would go to school and then they'd finish undergrad and come back Correct. they would kind of feel out of place because it's now like they had a new experience True. you know maybe they were serving like you were at school and then you come back and you kind of feel out of place you feel out of touch but then you're also trying to be submitted to the culture of that particular church How, why do you think it is that people go away like go to school and then they come back and they feel out of place like they feel like they can't really vibe with that culture anymore. Um, so I think the, the reason behind that is when we go to school, right, say we, one thing we have to understand in America is that when we go to school, all of our schools in America are in the boonies, right? Mm -hmm. Like I went to school in Lynchburg. I know people that went to school in Blacksburg, people that went to school in different, different like villages, right? Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of diasporan churches there. But in those churches, what they present is a is a is the American let's say just from America's yes. standpoint an American culture where it's kind of like hey speak up hey if you have a question ask if you don't understand something I'm not gonna be upset that you're asking me mm. this and etc and then they also find ways to get young people involved mm. right Correct. so there's a partnership from leadership to the members so young people feel like they have a voice. Young people feel like they have a part to play, mm -hmm. and it's not always being told what to do or being regulated to just a camp, a convention, uh, a, a youth uh, gathering, or et cetera mm -hmm. like that. They feel like they're part of Sunday's service back to back. And also sometimes the messages, like it's relatable. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes at church we have issues whereby some of our African diaspora churches, sometimes the messages being preached to just one people, which is a one age group, one generation. Yeah. So the, the child, the youth, the young adult comes back thinking like, man, did I get anything, right? Mm -hmm. But when they go to school, um, when they go to places or a church that it's, let's say, multicultural, yeah. the messages at times, and it's not all the time, but the messages at times are relatable. It's about, they kind of law and order them. When I say law and order, <laughs> like law and order, if anybody watches law and order, law and order finds out what's going on in the, in the world, in the and world. they make an episode according to that. Mm -hmm. So what happens is sometimes the messages are like, what's going on in the world? They kind of bring it in as an intro and then bring a Christ-centered uh, message, message out of that. So you walk out like, I actually got something. Right. Oh, I got it. Oh, I that song, oh, you added it to this. You know, so young people, when they come back home, um, they don't really have a place sometimes because they probably weren't allowed to actually maybe preach. They weren't probably allowed to... Um, the Bible studies and stuff like that. So they feel like it's regulated to just the pastor, maybe, and his wife. Good thing, like my church, we get to, I, knew, I learned how to do praise and worship at my church. Um, they gave me the opportunity to start a campus ministry. Mm -hmm. And I was able to preach. I was able to put preaching plans together. I was able to do programs. But when I came back to the main church, it was sometimes a bit hard I was lucky because I had a voice. Yes. So I could sing. Right. But for the one that was preaching at campus or was active in campus yeah, ministry, serving. when they come back, you know, they're kind of like, there's really no place for me. So they go to places where they can go. Mm -hmm. So it's not every church. Let me make sure I state that. Right. It's not every church. Some churches, some African diaspora churches are doing well. And some are not. You just have to find your place in this book to right. find out where you, where you stand. So then what do you suggest for... Um, like those particular situations where someone might go to school and come back and feel out of place, how do you suggest that we can um, 
accommodate them a bit more or yeah. get them included in what's going on? Definitely, I think it's an understand. What young people have to understand is that you have to. I always put it back to what Jesus did. The Bible says Jesus humbled himself unto death, mm. came down and died. Hebrews twelve two talks about how the joy set before him, his death. And then his resurrection was a joy set before him. Mm -hmm. I think we as young people have to take the approach of Christ, meaning we're humbling ourselves. We're coming to a place whereby we must do the most to get the most out of the relationship of our mm -hmm. parents, our pastors. How do we do that? We humble ourselves. We, we figure out ways. How can I get into the heart of my leader? Instead of going to my leader and saying, hey, pastor, mm -hmm. this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you could do better. The youth need money. The That's young adults good. need this. Nah, find a way, pastor. Your suit is nice. I like mm -hmm. it. Even if it's whack, it's awful. Your suit is nice. I'm feeling it. Except, can I have a meeting with you? Yeah. When you come in a meeting, bring him a gift. Hey, Pastor, how you doing? And then after, Pastor, I like that, what you did here. I like what you did there. But there's some few things I want to uh -huh, suggest. suggest. Yeah. So once you soften the heart of our parents, of our leaders, yeah. because they're coming from another culture, and we have right. to understand that. Right. The culture they're coming from, young people don't 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 have the ability just to speak their mind right. like that. America right. teaches that, and we talk about that in a book. When you read it, you'll see it. But it, wisdom, humility, respect. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the way we're able to, and, and, and speak up. Don't, like, I think my generation, what they do is, everything is social media. Mm. I'm like, bruh, find a way to speak up. Talk to somebody. Let your voice be heard. It can only be heard if you speak, but in wisdom, respect, and in humility. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I like that you said that because even the Bible talks about how soft words turn away wrath. And so that's a Correct. definite example of that. But yeah. with that, right, mm -hmm. maybe let's say someone has done that. Maybe they've humbled themselves. They're Correct. honoring their pastor. You know, they're respecting the leadership and, and trying to give advice where they can. But it seems like nothing's being done. Mm -hmm. And I speak to that because in your book specifically, you talk about um, a time where you raised a suggestion about something. Correct. And because you went to an American church and you saw that this was the way they were doing it, you're like, OK, let me bring this implementation into my own yeah, they church. They shut that down. They I shut it. They that. said, not here. Not here. But then <laughs> what we see happen, there's a yeah. plot twist because they go to Ghana and they see that, you know, I'm kind of giving away my book. I sorry, like, you know I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. I got to read my book. But you know, we giving them a foretaste. We giving yeah, them, you know, yeah. what to expect. <laughs> um, but then they go to Ghana. They see that this is a way the Ghana church is doing that. So immediately they want to implement it, right? Correct. And again, it goes back to what you were saying about lack of trust and transparency and things yeah. of that nature. Correct. What would you say about that? Um, now, with that, there's two things. I, I feel like, again, wisdom, respect, humility. Um, I've when you voice your opinion and they don't take it, mm -hmm. and you keep doing it, you keep doing it, keep doing it, you have to then sometimes use your own sphere of influence. So, for instance, not everything I've said in my church has been taken just like that. Right. But I stepped out. I did what the Lord called me to do within true worshipers, mm -hmm. and they've been able to see the effect. They've been able to see the impact. And I stepped away, not away from, I was serving, I did what I was called to do. Y'all right. go here, y'all right. do that, y'all do right. that, y'all do And I'm doing it while I'm also doing this here. Mm -hmm. And then time, has we've been doing church worship for 10 years. Now, people from, what started to be a DMV thing became an international thing. Mm -hmm. People from Canada, yeah. people from London are flying in. And they're now seeing that y'all had something. And I feel like it took time for them to see. But I also don't think it was somebody's ignorance, I also believe that it's timing and what God wants to do. Sometimes God takes us, through, young people, through things so that we become stronger. True. That we become greater. Because this problem I'm talking about right now, this African elephant we're talking about now, yeah. is going to be an issue for us mm. when my nephew comes into ministry and says, Yao doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. And I'm right. Gonna go. So the thing is that I'm going through, and I went through what I went through, because God was building me for a time like this so that when the next generation comes, I'll be able to adjust and understand that I had issues with the previous generation. This is how I, I solved it. So I tell people, listen to the voice of God. Don't move if God hasn't said so, move. That's good. You know, like I can look at churches that I could be a blessing. The churches want me to become their choir director. But the voice of the Lord, one, has not told me to move. Two, also, don't look at, you have to change your perspective. Don't look at what's going wrong. Look at what could actually be done that could be good. Yeah. 
And sometimes you got to spend your own money. Sometimes you got to spend your own time and take the youth out, do certain things, and invest. become the bridge and invest. Mm. And then when the parents begin to see that, ah, when my son hangs out with Yao, hangs out with Lindsay, I'm able to see that there's a change. There's a, that they're changing. Now we need to give this person a platform. Now by the grace of God, when I speak to my national head, to my pastors, apostles, they don't just say, what is he talking about? They really listen because they've seen a track record. They've also seen a loyalty that I've had to them mm -hmm. so that I sow a seed of loyalty so that even if the Lord will call me one day to go somewhere else, because what I've done here or what I've done uh, or if the Lord wants me to stay here, the Lord will then um, have a way whereby I'm reaping what I've sown. So we need to teach our generation, don't move unless God says, remain loyal and do what God's called you to do. And then at the appropriate time, they will see. So that when you make a suggestion, you just won't have a voice. You'll also have the spirit of influence, influence. on it. I always mm -hmm. tell people, Mr. Otebel can say the same thing I'm saying. I'll probably get five likes. He'll get a thousand likes. Why? He has a grace. He has a, a, a voice that the Lord has given him. And that voice comes through the secret place, comes through hard times, comes through trials and tribulations. But at the appropriate time, the Lord will make you shine. Amen. 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 Somebody drop some amens in the YouTube group chat. Amen. Like, this is a word. Um, but, yeah, I know that you also spoke to a couple different generations, right? Yeah. About why millennials are leaving the church. Yep, yep. And before we get into that real quick, can you just tell us a little bit of, about that? All right, fam. So this is what you, please, you got to watch this. I spoke to different pastors and young people. And we, we did a pre-recorded uh, podcast. It's a podcast that we're going to be doing called The African Elephant. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. It's going to be a dope. It's going to be the biggest. It's going to be bigger than Breakfast Club and everything. Amen. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, let me see you put an amen in the group chat if you believe that. <laughs> now, um, we spoke to pastors. We spoke to um, young people. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to get the reason why young people are leaving the church. Um, we spoke to a Church of Pentecost pastor. We spoke okay. to a Pastor Vic from I-5. Okay. You know, that's one of the biggest churches out here yes. in the DMV, yes. um, a Nigerian pastor. We spoke to people that used to go to the church, uh, African Diaspora Church, and then left. Mm. Some who are pastors, daughters, pastors, and then they left. Wow. Some who um, were brought in at a young age to pastor to help this thing. It's going to be dope. I'm not going to talk too much. Let's go to the, to the podcast. It's about 40 minutes. Um, but it's interesting. It's going to be dope. And we still got what? Joe Metal. We got Joe Metal. We, we got, got Skinny, Skinny Man. Man. We got, um, shoot, Listen. we have a, look, don't go. I have a conversation with parents about why they don't let us date outside of, you know, our culture. Our culture. Or that was a dope combo as well. So please stay tuned. Here we go. Lord, I need to talk to you right now. Why I feel like my church is home is because one thing. We talk about inclusivity, we talk about equality, we talk about, oh, let's not hurt people's feelings, but I feel like everybody needs that one auntie that looks at you and say, hey, you're getting fat. Who are these people who are gonna tell you when you're doing something that you're not supposed to do, you know? We need that in this generation, and this generation's gotten too comfortable with, oh, let's make them feel good, let's make them feel happy, but I don't think that's what church is about. It's not about making people feel all mushy and warm inside. Yes, that's family, but family also tells you and points out your wrongs and tells you you need to get better. I can't leave my church. Not any idolization or anything like that, but it's family. And family knows when you're doing something that's gonna derail you from the path of God. So like, I choose to stay rooted. I don't care what's going on out there. Not every church is for you. All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the African Elephant Podcast. Um, I know you're here watching the uh, book launching of the African Elephant. And I know you're having a good time so far. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I'm excited because we are about to have an amazing conversation with some amazing people, uh, people that I, 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 I really love their stories themselves, people I'm, I, I've, I've known for a long time, people that I'm just not even getting to know. But the beautiful thing is that Christ makes us all one and, and our stories 
um, make us all one as well. So I'm excited. You know, we're about to have a very good convo tonight. So please sit back and get ready as we talk about why young people are leaving the African diaspora church. All right. So before I begin, we want to get to know the beautiful people that are with us right now. Um, so please, if I can have you all just introduce yourselves, uh, who you are, let us know something we don't know about you. And let's, let's go from there. All right. Good. My name is uh, Nana Ban. I'm a professor at Seattle Pacific University in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. and a bivocational minister mm -hmm. with the Church of Pentecost USA Inc. That's right. Woo woo. That's my church, you know. Okay. So <laughs> awesome. God bless you, Pastor Nana. I heard you can speak some Spanish. Can you just give us like one line of Spanish? Hola, so I can... me llamo Pastor Roberto. Wow, wow. All I heard is Roberto, so I don't know if that was Robert or if that was Robert. <laughs> but God bless you. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. My name is Victor Ehiemeri. Um, I live in Maryland, USA. I'm the, well, one of the pastors at I-5 Church in Maryland, and it's my privilege to be here. Congratulations on your new book. I cannot wait to see the impact that it has. I think it's a much-needed book. Thank you awesome. so much. Awesome. And anybody who's not seen I-5 Church, you, I, it means you, you don't come from the DMV. That church is beautiful, big, and does, they do great things. So it's a beautiful to see an African diaspora uh, pastor, a Nigerian, to be one of the pastors out of such a great church. So God bless you so much, Pastor Vic, for being there. Mm -hmm. right. Hello, um, my name is Richard Kwachi, Pastor Richard Kwachi. In it, uh, in it, in it, in it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm from the Church of Pentecost UK, um, Church of Pentecost UK, I'm the National Youth Pastor here, um, and uh, you know, I'm a father of four, um, married to my beautiful wife, her name is Dorcas Kwachi, and um, I'm, I'm just excited about this book, about this conversation, I believe I'm a product of this conversation, and so um, yeah, we can't wait for the, the impact that this book is going to have, just as Pastor Victor has already said. Awesome, awesome. He's the one who, he's trying to make us look bad. We didn't see our wives. Me too. I'm also married and my wife is around, but it's all good. <laughs> oh man, God bless you guys. God bless you so much. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lexine Cujo and I live in the great city of Houston. Um, I'm a dean of instruction. So basically, I coach teachers at a charter school, uh, middle school, and high school. And I'm also very, 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 very excited about this conversation. I love the play on words, African elephant, and I just can't wait for us to get into it. So Awesome. God bless you, Lexine. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Joycelyn Ogunshala. I am also an author. Um, I'm a writer and a podcast host. And I live in Bowie, Maryland. And I'm just excited to be a part of the conversation. I think it's very much so needed. And yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being a part. God bless you so much. And, um, my name is uh, Nane Tuahini. I'm, uh, I'm from the Church of Apostolic. That's and, right. Uh, That's right. I'm the, the the USA area leader, which basically the whole youth, I'm the president. <laughs> and um, I'm also um, a, a, a graphic designer as well as an IT tech. And that's why you're seeing all this stuff behind me. So this is my little office at home. So. I'm glad to join this particular conversation because, as Yao said, I've been in Apostolic for a minute, and it's ever since I got saved, literally, and that's the only church I've been in. And so, Yao called me about this, and he was like, "You've stayed, so let's talk. <laughs> so, we are here to talk." Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Thank you, Nana. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Asante, and uh, I fellowship with the Church of Pentecost in Virginia. Um, Northern Virginia, to be very specific. And essentially what uh, I've been doing in the community, I serve within a youth organization called Youth Under His Glory. It's a youth organization that myself and a few of uh, my friends had started in college. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really excited about this book, only because I feel like Yao has taken all my complaints over the years <laughs> uh, and kind of curated it into a, a, a book uh, for the world to read. So um, it's exciting uh, to finally have an open conversation about this and also look at a progressive means to bridge some gaps. 
Definitely, definitely. God bless you all. Again, we're going to be talking about things that are in um, this book, The African Elephant. And um, let's let's go let's go straight to, to it. And we want to give respect and honor to our fathers and our father, uh, Pastor Nana. Of, uh, um, we want to. I want to ask you this question. And the first question I want to ask you is: um, Do I guess because we all go to the Church of Pentecost, right? So not all of us, I guess me, Sam, and you. But we do know that Church of Pentecost is noted uh, for the speed in which it continues to grow in the diaspora. It's in basically every uh, continent. I'm sure the only place we're not is in in Antarctica or something. (laughs) I think that's the only spot. But um, being a pastor within COP, what do you think the Church of Pentecost has done well that has led to this growth? Yeah, Nikki, and thanks for, for that question. Um, maybe to, to start off, I wouldn't necessarily say that we have grown fast uh, in the USA. It's more accurate to say that we have grown steadily. Okay. The church started uh, in 1988, 89. And this is 2020, and our membership is slightly over 30,000. And that's not an astronomical growth. Uh, On the average, uh, annually, we have been growing at about 6, 6.5%. We did a research recently, and uh, that's about a figure for, for North America. Uh, But that aside, uh, we've done some some pretty good things uh, over the years to be able to minimize what others have called the millennial exodus, uh, the anything but church uh, syndrome. Uh, We've been able to do a few things uh, to retain the the young adults. And uh, one of those is leadership. Uh, leadership is first and foremost in, in everything. If you have the right shepherd, uh, he will take care of the flock and uh, he will give them the appropriate nourishment. And so over the years uh, in the USA, uh, God has blessed us with some pretty dynamic, competent, skillful, and um, what do you call it? Uh, very uh, eloquent leaders leaders who are able to identify with the young adults. I don't want to mention names, yeah. uh, but we, we know who they are, right? Yeah, they yeah. An excellent job uh, mm-hmm. handling the youth and the pension. So leadership has been, has been very good. Uh, without that, I guarantee you, we would have lost a lot more of the young adults. Uh, thanks to the dynamic work of this group of uh, leaders. I think we have done an excellent job retaining um, the, the young adults. Awesome. Do you think, um, do you think looking at the steady growth that we've seen so far within the Church of Pentecost and how you explained it to be steady, do you see that in the next 10 years, would it still be steady? Would the speed slow? Do you think it's going to slow down? Do you think well, the speed is going to speed up what do you how do you see it i think it depends it depends um it can slow down uh if we don't continue on the current pace Mm -hmm. right if we bring in wrong leaders most definitely it is going to slow down Mm. but if we continue to do what we are doing and add a little bit more for example Mm -hmm. uh, let me let me say this uh, you guys are familiar with the movie called The Godfather, right? Yeah. There's something we call the Godfather Syndrome. What mm. is it? It is hypocrisy. Mm. And that's a big problem. Big problem for many churches. You see, and it starts from the home and it goes to the church. At home, what we do and the kids see what we do. And it's the exact opposite of what the church preaches. Hmm. Mom is screaming at the kids. When dad tries to intervene, then there is a conflict. 
Yes. Dad is screaming at the kids. When mom tries to intervene, then there's a conflict. We send the wrong signal to the children at home. Mm. And yet when they go outside, let's say they go to visit their, their friends uh, in their homes, what do they see? They see harmony. And here is it. Their friends even don't go to church. <laughs> <laughs> so they are getting harmony from folks who don't go to church. And what are they getting from people who go to church? Confusion and conflict. Mm -hmm. That's the Godfather syndrome. If we are able to overcome that, I think that we have a good chance uh, of, of speeding up where, where we are today. And then also, and then also, we're going to have to continue to adapt. Adaptation is very important. We're doing very well now. Okay. We have to continue to adapt. Right? Yeah. When you look at the COVID. People couldn't go to church. So what do we yeah. do? We are streaming live on, on yeah. the internet. Right? True. Uh, Zoom, Facebook. Yeah, we're doing all of that. This mm -hmm. is not a typical COP church. Mm. It's not typical. So we, we're doing well in adapting. And then we're going to have to continue to be flexible. we got to move with the times. If we are able to do that, I think we would we would speed up and finally just yeah. not to, to take all the time mm -hmm. we're going to have to engage the young adults more than we have done in the past see because some of their complaints are that nobody listens to us mm -hmm. nobody respects us we are irrelevant in the church all the adults everything they are doing we don't do anything so we we are going to have to continue to engage them and True. if we do i think that our growth is going to to to, to speed up an upward trend awesome awesome I, I think that's some great points you made i think i saw joycelyn shaking her head a lot like man i think but that's the by saying is real talk now joycelyn um it, and for everybody in my book in chapter three i talk about issues at at, at home and how the issues at home because our parents are the pastors, the elders, the deacons, deaconesses. Whatever we do at home is actually going to trickle into church, right? So, Joyce, and I just noticed how you were shaking your head. Is there something you want to touch on when it comes to home, the hypocrisy, that thing? Like, I really liked how uh, Pastor Ma hit, hit on that. Yes, absolutely. So, um, my father's a pastor, and I grew up in a Christian home all my life. Like, I've had knowledge of Christ, and then I got saved when I was 15. But in the home, it was just the culture was always different. Um, like, and it didn't translate into, like, Sunday service. At home, it would be, like, my dad and their relationship, my parents' relationship. It wouldn't translate into um, just how you would typically think like a first lady and a pastor would actually um, are supposed to behave. And um, because I, I got saved at such a young age, I knew better. Like I knew that, okay, yeah, like, of course I've never been married before, but I know that like marriage is supposed to reflect um, Christ in his church. And I don't think that this is truly like a reflection of it's truly representing Christ and his church well. And so there will be different instances where my parents would argue, um, then go to church and act like everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's common for a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, millennials and, and they see the hypocrisy, they see the, the, it's just, it's not genuine. And so it's like, mm -hmm. you tell me to follow Christ, you're preaching Jesus is Lord. And I don't really see like Jesus being manifested in your life. I don't see the fruits of the spirit being manifested in your life. And so, um, it's a very real thing. It's a very real thing. And so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I, 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 I think I definitely agree with you. I feel like we have a lot of people who see something at home, but they don't really uh, see the Christ as being preached, right? And I think the issue that I um, also have is what do we do with these young people who are trapped in the middle, right? It's like they know, like you said, Justin, you know what's right. You knew how, uh, what Christ told us to do in scriptures, but you just really didn't see it from leadership yes. when growing up, but, yeah. but, but you knew. So you're kind of in the middle. It's like, this is my dad's church, right? <laughs> and, um, but I'm not growing. I'm not seeing something. 
what do I do? Now, Nana, I want to bring this to you. Like, Nana, um, you've been in apostolic, so your church is um, apostolic, right? You're the national leader there. As long as I can remember, you were there from the beginning and you're still there, right? And the question is, um, how does one get over the hypocrisy? Because I'm sure you've seen a lot of it, right? You've seen certain things that just doesn't seem right. Like presidency meetings, you're probably there, you're like, this doesn't make sense. But you stayed. Um, what's the secret behind you staying? What advice can you give somebody else? Or should we get mad when people feel like, hey, I feel like I can grow at another church. Like, can you speak on that? Well, I've kind of gone through both emotions, but I think my, for me personally, how I got saved played a role into why I kind of sticked around because I was in the world, literally lived the world, saw how the world was. And I'm not saying that other people did not, but my household was not a Christian home. You know, my dad was a Methodist guy when we were in Ghana, but when he came here, he never wanted to go to church because one of his philosophy was a lot of the people who were in church, all they want is your tithes and your offering. So mm -hmm. he never stepped in church since he came to America. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I didn't really grow up in the church, you know, and I got saved. So when I came in the church, I had a passion for the Lord and I, I kind of knew what I was looking for. You know, I remember one time right in front of me, elders, there was a, uh, we were at a small church at, uh, on the Richmond highway. And, um, I don't know what happened, but the elders were, were arguing. All of a sudden, one of them got up and smacked another one. <laughs> and, you know, hey. I mean, I was there and I was like, man, they, this happening in church? You know, but <laughs> it didn't strike me to, like, leave the church. Because once again, I knew what Christ had done for me. Now, fast forward, after experiencing church culture or church lifestyle for a while, I got to a point where I felt like, you know, like that. When it, as a young person, the church wasn't putting too much into the young people, you know. And I've, 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 yeah, as you know, like I've been the youth leader, I've been in Virginia for a minute, and it just felt like there was so much focus on the adults because they were the ones that were giving the tights and little focus on the kids. So it was frustrating because it just looked like there wasn't enough attention being given to the youth. And I really did get to a point where I was like, man, screw this church, I want to go to another church. And it was another brother I was talking to him, and he really encouraged me. So he was like, look, going to another church is not going to solve your problem. If you want change, you have to be that change. You have to be that person that comes up in leadership to help build that change that you are crying about right now. And mm -hmm. for me, that was a, a big 360 for me because I was on that verge of trying to leave the church, having that same experience as everybody else. You know, my church is not good enough. Let me go to another church. But I remember one of our old, one of the pastors, the long time ago, I'm going to say this, I'm going to end. He was like, you know, um, everybody thinks their church is bad. But then when you go to another church, you're going to see that your church is not as bad as you think. You know, and he was using Anglican. And Anglican had this, if you grew up in Ghana, they had this bell thing. And there was somebody who left, who left one church and went to another church. And then from there went to another church. And that church, one day they were uh, doing the Anglican thing, was Ahadi and Kanka, Ahadi and Kanka, basically saying, this place is even worse than where you are coming from. You know, so <laughs> we, there is no perfect church. You know, so getting all that understanding, personally, I got to a point where I was like, you know what, where you are, if you can make a difference, make that difference. And, and that's the best you can do, because there's no perfect yeah. church. Every church has a problem. Yeah, and I, I'm going to po point this question to Pastor Victor. Now, <clears throat> I've heard that a lot, like, there's no perfect church. Of course, there's no perfect human being. So of course, there won't be any perfect church. But what about the young person who tries to make a change? Every church is different. Like for, let me give you an, let me give you an example. For me, I was born into Trinity Baptist Church by Reverend Kingsley PJ. That was more of an independent Baptist. Then when I came to America, um, and I know you, you and Sam, you know, I was in GICC, Pastor Champon, on the, on the highway, charismatic, independent. It wasn't until I was like 16, 17 that I got introduced to Pentecost. And I was like, this place is, you know, it's great. I like it here. But the issue I, I, the issue I noticed with church is that every church is different in structure. What I could do in ICCM may be different than what I can do in Pentecost. Pentecost may have more protocols, right? Whereby wanting to do something can take years. Like, you know, I tell people, some people say, there's a church that will say, hey, we have an open door policy. When you go into the door, 
and you sit down with the pastor and say, hey, did you go to your presiding elder first? I'm like, bro, you just said it's an open door policy. <laughs> like, <laughs> if it's open door, why are you now telling me to go to, you know? So sometimes I have a, a part in the book where I talk about protocols need to be lessened, right? Now, Pastor Victor, what do we talk, tell a young person who's frustrated because they want to change? They want to do good. Like they gather the youth to, to, to help the youth, but then maybe a pastor, a church leader, assistant pastor may think he's trying to start his own church. He's trying to do this. Like, should he just go for the sake of his own Christianity or does he stay to keep trying to make a change? Like, what, what do we do? <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's funny. Um, what, 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 what do I think? This is what I think. I think you earn the right to, 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 to ch change anything. You earn it. The mm -hmm. difficulty with young people, I know I'm a young person, but I have an old soul. The difficulty with us young people is that we try to change um, things in places we have not earned the right to change anything. Mm -hmm. You earn the right to change things by being loyal, by serving the vision of the house, then you get to sit and dream with those who vision for the house. And I'm saying that from practical experience. One of the reasons that our generation is not a very patient, process-driven generation. We don't mm. want to, we don't want to wait. If God gives you the dream, it's happening now. Like God <laughs> say you're gonna be a pastor, you're 17, you begin now. No, God has just told you what he's going to do. If you are now with him to do it, it might not happen now. It might not happen for the next eight years or 10 years. But what I'll tell the people one is to find, I always tell people this, you must have somebody in your life who can tell you to shut up and sit down and you don't say a word. You just shut up and sit down. The end. Like you're not trying to rationalize anything. You're not trying to thus say at the law. I don't care what God told you. Shut up, sit down. If you don't have that person in your life, I don't think you're in the, you, have, you have the right frame to live anywhere. There has to be a level of submission and humility. Nothing, I'm going to say this in closing, nothing done in honor is wasted. Mm. Nothing done in honor is wasted. No matter how long you spend honoring something, it is never wasted. Sometimes we forget that God can accelerate things. It can look like you've wasted your time. 10 years. No, you're serving. It's developing something on the inside of you. I'm of the school of thought that I want to do to other people what I want people to do to me. So if you mm. want people to rebel against you, re rebel against your pastor now. And you keep trying. You know what I mean? You carry out the pastor's plan first before you add your own. I had to do that. When I was growing up, I, I, I was exposed to all kinds of things and I would go and learn some new things and come back and want to, let's buy this. I remember one day we went, let me tell you how stubborn I was. I said I was going to end up, let me just share a personal story. I was very stubborn. I am very stubborn. Let's not say was, I'm still here and I'm still stubborn. I am very stubborn, but then I was very stubborn. I wanted a keyboard. I used to play key, 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 keyboard in church and I told our president, I want this keyboard. I want a cog tri 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 item. That's what I want. So we got the money. They didn't give me enough money. And I said, this money is not enough to buy the cock Triton. They were like, go and buy what the keyboard, the money the keyboard can buy. I was like, okay, let me tell you how stubborn I was. I went all the way from the east of Nigeria to L Lagos, saw the cock Triton, saw other keyboards I could have, have afforded with the money they gave me, got in the bus and came back without a key 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 keyboard to prove a point. Guess what happened? The very next week, they bought another keyboard and put it in front of me. And guess what? I played it. So my rebellion didn't do anything. If not, if anything, it cost me years of what could have been my time to influence things. Now, what would have happened if I went there after saying that is not the best and I get what we can afford? And he realizes, you know what? You served. You know what is best, but your heart is still big enough to still serve in a small thing as playing whatever keyboard we give to you that mm. earns you pr pr promotion after D D D D D david was anointed he still served saul he played the harp for him he commanded his army for him he killed enemies for he still did things had an opportunity to kill saul and refused to take it because the worst thing you can do is grab something you're supposed to be g g g g g even if you grab something you're supposed to be given, you will set yourself back here. So ask them to stay and serve. 
get mm. a mentor and under spiritual guidance, you can either stay or leave. I see. So I guess, um, and I guess I put that to Sam. Um, you said something when we were talking. You said, well, if God said um, still, you need a mentor that will say sit down and shut up. So what do we tell the person? And I guess maybe between you, you Pastor Victor and Sam, the person who said, but God said, and then there's a leader that is making uh, maybe a church a leader that mm -hmm. makes it a bit hard for a young person to operate because they want their vision taken care of. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to that person? Uh, hey, yeah, God said, but sit down and wait. Do we listen to God? Or do we listen to that person, mm -hmm. I guess. So I, I, think, I, I think you, you got to look at it in twofold. Um, from my experience, how I've seen it is with a lot of my colleagues has been God said I should do this, and who 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 do I submit to? God or man? Right? Should I listen to God or should I listen to man? But I think the there's a fine line, um, and that is what has been missing from my experience. Right? Um, if I come to a leader and I mention to them, I've been seeking the Lord, and this is what the Lord has been placing upon my heart. I think the response of the leader is what is going to either accelerate my rebellion or bring me to humility. Right. And I think that within um, my experience, specifically within the African church, it has always been um, some level of red tape that makes it difficult for me to even want to, uh, I guess, submit to the leadership because I come and I say, this is what the Lord is telling me. And then the first response I, I, I get is, let me go and pray about it. Absolutely. It's totally warranted for a man of God to seek God for confirmation in any in, in, um, that they see fit. However, what would happen is after the we get like basically the response of let me go and pray about it. That is the end of it. Right. No follow up, no check in. And I think those are the things that basically incite rebellion within young people, because if, you know, I experienced it today. If, um, you know, one of my, my, my younger brothers or sisters call me and they say, hey, I God has placed a desire in my heart to do this within, uh, you know, our youth ministry. I will tell them, let me go and pray about it. But I make it a responsibility and a priority for myself to check back with them and say that I prayed about it. And this is what I think we can do. I think when we get the sense of partnership from leadership, it makes submission and humility easy. But when we don't get partnership, it's like you're um, ostracized, and therefore your only the only um, solution is to rebel. Just go do what you believe God is really pressing your heart on. Yeah, I, I think you want yeah, to touch I, on that. Yeah, that's just that's a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I th you're very right, um, Sam. You're very right. Like, but I think I'll, I'll add something pre. The partnership should begin before the big decision has to be made. That's why I mean you need to have somebody in your life who is working with you. It's those people. Most time, not even your pastor, is that other adults, that trusted adults that you're working with, and it's not about the big decision. If you go to seek counsel during the, the, the big decision, understand who you are speaking to. You're speaking to people who don't know you and who don't know the call of God upon your life. I don't know what kind of answer you expect to get from people who don't know you. So, but yeah. when you have somebody right now you're working with, you're telling them when it begins. That little hey, I just I went to church today, didn't really feel, just feeling this thing. They're like, okay, let's, let's pray about this thing. It begins with just a feeling, a thing, before we get to God said. That person has journeyed with you, and they know at what yeah. point they can be like, yes or no. So I think you're very right. There should be a partnership. Our leaders and us, our generation, should form a partnership much earlier than when it's necessary to make a turn. Um, that's what I think. Yeah. And, and um, I, I pass it by now. If you, I'll give you like one minute, 30 yeah. seconds. So, yep, thank you. Yeah. No, yeah, I was going to say that uh, going back to what Sam said, um, Sam, if and when you are not getting the engagement you need, right? Uh, so you share this with a leader and you never hear back from them, I, I, would, I would follow up. I, I would really follow up. Hey, Elder, I shared this with you the other day. What's going on? <laughs> See, because the, the honest then is on you. Yeah. yeah. You are the one who got, whether it was a vision or an intuition, whatever it is, it doesn't hurt to follow up. Right. But, uh -huh. but, but Pastor, Pastor, like, I, you know, I'm going to also side with Sam here on something that I think 
when you the more you follow up, the more they make it looks like you're the you're yes, the I'm crazy <laughs> one. Like you're the one that's like like hey, a person yes awful. Peso, yeah, he wants to do like basically for the Nigerians and other people. Are, what I said was they're, they're going to think you actually want the ministry itself or you want to be a pastor yourself. The more you push certain directional topics that God's laid in your heart, mm-hmm. it becomes some way. And I've noticed something. And this is another topic for another day because we have to move on. But this topic about um, apostolic, redeemed, um, Witness, there's, um, uh, there's churches that have a transfer system that sometimes doesn't even really help the process of building partnership with young people. Like if I'm with a pastor for four years and then he's built me, the next person that comes may not have the same kind of relational kind of thing. So we're starting back from square one. So the fathering system becomes difficult. If you ask me how many spiritual fathers I got, I could probably give you like six only because I've had different pastors come in and out of my of my life. You know, sometimes you get a one who loves you. Like true worshipers, we've been through that. One year, we can have somebody who's behind us. The next year, we'll have a pastor that looks, it looks like true worshipers is not, not the thing. And then the next pastor will come and say, oh my God, I love what you're doing. The next person will come. And then you may think I'm exaggerating, but this is really what we've gone through. One pastor for us, one pastor against us, one pastor for us. So I think, and this is just me, there should be intentionality on the parts of pastors to shepherd young people. In my introduction, I talk about that. Uh, this good shepherd left the 99 to look for the one. That one who may be rebellious. That one who looked some way. That one, you know, but um, I have, because of time, we're going to have more conversations like this. Uh, I'll bring these people back on, but we're going to move on to Lexine. Um, we're talking about the African church. We're talking about young people. Why are they leaving uh, the church? Some are in it, some are uncomfortable, some are happy in it. But Lexine, the reason I brought you on is because I noticed with you, you were attending two different churches at the same time, right? Um, and I want to find out from you, what were you getting from one that you couldn't get from the other? And why couldn't you just say like, hey, I'll just do this one. What were you thinking at that time? I want to see if other people who are watching live on YouTube right now have gone through that as well. Right, right. Um, I think initially I've always been, I've always went to COP. So wherever I moved to, I would find where the COP was or like someone will say, oh, you know, Lexine is moving to Boston or Houston or wherever, like, you know, find her. And so it's this big community network, global community network. And so I think I've always felt a guilt for leaving completely because I grew up in the church and you, you, it kind of looks bad to leave. Um, not to say that it's a cult or anything, but it feels wrong to leave. Let me just, let, let me just leave it there. I think when I started reading the book of Acts, um, I desired that church where they had everything in common, everybody was sharing everything and they committed themselves to the teachings and everyday numbers were being added and it was this big kumbaya. And I'm like, where is this church? Because I want to live scripture. Like I want something more practical, like tell me what the Bible looks like today in my context. What am I supposed to be doing? And I felt like I would go to church and I would get very similar sermons. And so as I'm doing my own study, I wasn't feeling the challenge in um, in the sermons. I didn't feel like I was moved to do anything in my practical life. Like when I go to work, what does it look like to be a Christian in that space? So I started going to a, another church where I felt like they were doing different series that pertain to my life, right? So like, what does it look like to be a believer as a teacher? What does it look like? And all the stuff that comes with it, I'm going to have students with different backgrounds. I'm going to talk to parents. Like, what does that look like practically? Um, and so I loved that church for that reason, but I also felt like I couldn't leave the church that raised me. I did, I did talk to one deepness that's a mentor to me. And she was like, you can't leave because it looks bad um, to the youth and you mentor the youth. (laughs) And so I stayed mostly for the youth. Like I felt this loyalty to the church, but I also stayed for the youth because I do mentor them. And I think that uh, 
I just didn't want them to feel like somebody was leaving them behind for like something better. Yeah, that's um, real. And so I, I still mentor them. We have our own like Bible studies on Sundays. And so I still have that piece where like a part of me is still connected because of family, because it's Ghanaian, because of culture and all of that stuff. And yeah. then I go to actually more than two churches. I go to different churches to get something from the teachings actually. Mm. Uh, because I feel like I, the more I learn, the more I want more and yeah. I want to be challenged more. And so I'm like all over the place so that I can. So, so, Lexine, so, Lexine, so what you're saying is like you wanted to still get the jollof fries, the dancing, the, you know, shaking. But then you wanted to, you felt like you got teachings that um, were relevant to you and your time. And I think that's something a lot of young people are looking for. Sometimes uh, we typically say we don't really understand the message. Look, it's so bad. I remember I met Pastor Nana. <laughs> I met Pastor Nana by, at a PRWC conference. This, and you know me, I've been in Pentecost for so long, I feel like I know all the pastors. But for some reason, I was like, who is this man standing here preaching so well? And it was kind of like, it was a shock to me and my friends, only because we felt like it's we don't really hear relevant cultural messages. It's the first time I've heard a pastor preach on culture. And I was just like, whoa, I was amazed. And I left like empowered to go into my community and change my neighborhood. And it was a blessing. So I understand sometimes we were missing preachings that we feel like is relevant to us. Now, um, Joycelyn, I wanna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna get to Pastor um, Richard in the UK, but Joycelyn, I, I wanna figure something out. You left your parents' church, I think, I'm not sure if you want to say the church's name, but um, you left your parents' church, but then you didn't actually leave to a multicultural church like what Lexine was doing. You actually went into another African diaspora church. And now, Pastor Rich, I know it's even late where you are, but thank you so much. And now, you know, we've talked about different things that we've noticed as, as causing young people not to really stay in the African diaspora church. Now you're in the UK. The first question I want to ask you, is Europe going through the same thing we're talking about in the States? And then two, how did they use you to confront the elephant in the room? Wow, those are two big questions. Um, I, I think that the, the, the simple answer really to the first one is absolutely. Um, Europe is probably facing um, this particular issue even in an even bigger way, in my opinion, um, because in Europe, we've also got the language issue um, where there's just so many different languages and you've got Africans that are coming in um, mostly speak English or, you know, if, if you're from Congo or another country like that, it's more or less French. Uh, so if you've got a French person from an African country coming to Germany, for example, there's already that barrier there, you know, so integration becomes the more difficult. And then you're raising children who are sort of a part of the community, a part of the furniture of the country, and you already have this barrier in the house. So, um, yes, we, we've, we've had big issues such as this in in Europe. Um, obviously, I can talk more from the United Kingdom perspective, um, especially, you know, being a product of this nation, but also being a child raised in an African home. Um, one thing that we found quite big, and, you know, when you talk about the elephant, I actually think the elephant is in both ways, really. The elephant was you know, sitting on the shoulders of the young people as much as it was sitting on the shoulders of, of the older people. I see. Um, because the, the, we, we, at some point in, in this nation, around about 2012, around about then, just around the Olympics time, um, we had a big exodus of millennials and young people um, going to Hillsong, for example. Oh, okay. uh, and as we know, Hillsong is very um, musical, performative, experiential, um, and, you know, you, you get all the flashing lights and the big screens, the concert sort of look. Yeah. And, um, a lot of our young people were leaving. And, and one of the, the, the reasons that we found was um, similar to what we was talking about earlier. Um, young people were visualizing the church as they visualize their homes. And um, they see when they look at the church, they look at the leaders they're seeing their mom and they're seeing their dad. And so if their mom is doing their head in, their dad is doing their head in or how they're being raised is, is a way they don't like. 
um, that's the same way they were seeing the church because it's the same image. Um, and where many young people want to get away from their homes, but because of biology couldn't, they know they can get away from the church, you know, um, and perhaps go to a space where they feel like it's more their fabric and it meets their cultural needs. So a lot of young people were leaving for, you know, Hillsong and um, other churches like that, Hope City and churches like that. Um, for me coming in, I'll be honest, I think initially um, I've never really envisioned being a pastor. Honestly, I, I sometimes I wake up and I'm like, yo, I'm, yo, 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 I don't mean to cut him off. He used to be a rapper, yo. He actually used to be a rapper. I remember him as Radiant the Rapper. <laughs> and that's why I love your story so much that Pentecost took a chance on you and it's beautiful. Continue. Continue. Yes, sir. I mean, um, yeah, as, as you said, that, 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 that was never really the outlook um, I had. And I believe um, there was a season in my life where God said, all right, you know what, park the albums, park the shows. I want you to serve your church. And, and this was what I wanted to do around about 2010. So I sort of just decided to serve, partner with leaders, work with leaders. Um, if it's just as simple as helping a leader do a report, you know, that was just something I wanted to do. And um, that, that kind of taught me something different about the church, um, that sometimes we were a bit, we were mocking what we didn't understand, you know. Um, a lot of the time, they, they just wanted a young person to be themselves, but at the same time, um, offering partnership, offering labor, um, offering that they have a heart for God um, and actually be about what they're saying they're about, not just, you know, being passionate and vibrant and talking the talk, but not really walking the walk. And that taught me a lot at the time. And I, I felt like that was our elephant as young people. You know, um, as I obviously grew up in the ranks and um, uh, cutting a long story short, at 26, I was called to the full time ministry. Um, very, very tough, tough decision to make because I knew the backlash I would have. Um, you know, there's there, there had never been that case in the United Kingdom um, church, Church Pentecost before. And I knew I was going to be a scapegoat in that sense. Some people were going to absolutely hate me. Um, I've, I've been called all sorts of things, you know, uh, baby pasta apprentice pastor, you know, just, they look at you, they, they don't know what you're going to deliver, but they've already yeah. decided, you know, he ain't got nothing to give. He's just going to come and do yo, yo, yo. And that's it. Yo, yo, oh, yo. <laughs> I, had, I, had the, I had the whole rapper thing about me as well at the time. So um, you can't really shake that off, especially in the African community. So um, I felt, I felt like um, at the time it gave the young people um, something to, I guess, relate to someone to relate to and actually it was a big statement for the church to young people that actually um if you put yourself out there to you know put your heart out there to serve um, there's a place for you and we are ready to give the baton you know we're not looking to clinch onto it till our grave we're, we're ready to give it um and, and i believe that we've had we've been so blessed with national heads that have you know, have really invested in young people, um, not just for tokenistic reasons, you know, and, and this is probably the advisory element that I'm going to end on. Um, sometimes you can put a young person there as a poster boy, um, just as some sort of token, um, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem because um, we can, you can mourn the, you can mourn the absence of young church leaders um, by bringing in a young leader, but if you belittle the way they lead, if you don't respect what they do and in the culture and the way they do it, then actually you're not delivering anything at all because the young people will see that this is just a token boy. This is just a poster boy, but yeah. they ain't really for us, you know? So um, I believe that this is the direction really that churches should go to. They should look out for young people who have that heart to serve, really want to give, are called by God and invest in them believe in them not just as poster boys but actually in the delivery of of what the culture also represents so that's what i would say really in a, in a long-winded way nah, this thank you so much i you know our time is up um but um I, I love that to be honest i think pastor richard what you don't understand is you being called at 26 you doing what you did uh what you're doing at your age you are now um you sticking up for social activities, even in America, 
makes me feel like, you know, there's hope. We can make change in our church as well. So may God bless you and keep you. Now, um, but what, what we're going to do is this. I'm going to give everybody third. I'm going to give everybody but Pastor Richard, since Pastor Richard already gave his uh, kind of solution. I'm going to give everybody 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds. And you're just going to give me ways we think we can keep young people in the church and what we can do together. And this is 30 seconds. All right. Um, now I'm going to stay in mind so that I can help you guys. 30 seconds. Somebody time me. So one thing I've noticed that the reason I've stayed in my church and I, I love my church, um, um, we, we may have some beefs one, two, one, two here and there, but I love my church. Right. And the thing is this, um, I had mentors. I had people who saw something in me and drew me in my area head. Apostle Yadam at that time, took me in, made me live with him. My friends, Kofi Boache, Sam, Inchi, Omari, Kwan Boache, all them, they, they took me in, they raised me, Auntie Priscilla. I mean, I have people, Pastor Sam, people are there who just saw me and said, I'm not gonna let you go wayward. Even though you might have a mouth on you, don't you, but you still have a gift on you. So I'm going to make sure that we groom you up. And I am who I am because they were there and I'm still here bringing change because somebody took a chance on me. Uh, Pastor Ba, how can we do that? 30 seconds, sir. Pastor Ba, 30 seconds. You're on mute. Okay, so, okay. Um, yes. So, two things, right? Yeah. Two things. Uh, let's, let's make sure that we maintain a balance between discipleship and uh, practice hmm. no, it's not just bible study bible study bible study bible study uh, young people would like to vent they need outlets take them out engage them in community activities so then you have that balance and then the right. last one is let's up the interaction with the young adults they need mentors let's talk hmm. to them that's right that's very important Thank you. That's right. God bless you, Pastor. I like that. Let's see. Let's go. 30 seconds. Ooh, I'm going to try. Uh, there's this uh, new thing that I'm into. It's called walking in the light. Um, first John chapter one, verses five through nine. And basically is there's a, a, a couple of churches that are doing it and they're extremely vulnerable about their sin struggles and they labor in mm -hmm. prayer and they're vulnerable and they encourage each other and support each other with what mm. they're struggling with. And I think a lot of churches, a lot of young people also feel very judged, but are also really struggling in their sin. And so mm. if coupled with discipleship, mentorship, if there's also a community feel where we are vulnerable, where we Jesus. share our sin struggles, we labor in prayer, we we support each other with our sin and, and help us you know, walk in the light of Christ, I think a lot of young people would stay in those spaces. Awesome. Transparency. That's deep. God bless you. All right, Sam. Asante, let's go. 30 seconds. I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up and say intentionality. Mm. I think with everything that we do, um, results come when we actually invest something with an anticipation of the end result. If mm. we can't picture what the end result is, it's, it doesn't matter what we are investing. Um, I mm. think a lot of times we come up with great ideas, great initiatives, but we're doing it just because it's great. We're not mm. doing it because we want to analyze the result and therefore at the end of it, go back and do a analysis to see, did we obtain what we desire to get out of this? And I think if we begin to implore that within our diaspora church, we'll begin to see a lot of difference. And if you look at, you know, a lot of the churches that many of us throng to is because they, they intentionally put something out there to mm. gain a specific result and they win because we see it and we gravitate towards it. That's right. That's right. Intentionality. I love that, man. God bless you. Pastor Vic. Um, thank you so much again. I think what I would say is this, the, the, this is not new. What is happening now is not new. Our parents left um, Orthodox church, 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 churches in the beginning, left Catholic churches and Anglican churches. The question is why did they leave those churches? to start the churches that we are living now. The even more difficult question is what churches are our kids going to go to? Because That's if right. we left our parents' churches and our parents left their parents' churches, <laughs> our kids are going to leave our churches. So we mm. need to prepare and answer that question now, 
now that we are living, why are, why am I living? And there are three reasons why we stay in church or we leave church: emotional reasons, cultural reasons, or spiritual reasons. Every church I knew, I know that our parents' generation started was because they felt they needed a spiritual revival. People needed an encounter with Christ, and they didn't feel that the environment they were in was offering that. So they started this this many churches, winners and every redeemed and all the churches. They broke out of there because of a spiritual reason. If we stay in our, our parents' our parents' church because of emotional or cultural reasons, we are going to bankrupt the next generation. Our parents must take the um, responsibility to create a spiritual culture that keeps the next generation, and then we must take the responsibility to create a spiritual culture for our kids to stay in these, these churches. Thank you. Bang. God bless you. That's for banana. What about you? Yeah, I think uh, for me personally, what has helped me and what I think will help the church is the vulnerability and the discipleship. Okay. As Pastor Ban said, I, I think personally, I've been very vulnerable in my life, all that I've done. And surprisingly, people uh, appeal to that. Like they, they like that. And, <laughs> NBA. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, just discipleship. I believe that we should be doers of the word and not just hearers. So I think it's something that we should, we should reflect that, be vulnerable, and teach people how to do it. And of course, being mentors to people, um, mm -hmm. the brother that came into my life, that even helped me to become a youth leader, I always cherish that moment in my life because I honestly don't know where I'll be in my Christian life if that man had not That's put right. me aside and said that I think you have this potential to be a youth leader. And so That's sometimes right. somebody may have a gift, but they don't know. And I think sometimes in the African culture, especially, the adults feel like they're too high and can't come low. I think we need to come low to help the youth to get yeah. to the level they need to get to. Yeah. God bless you, and I appreciate that. And uh, Joyce and I will let you uh, finish uh, 30 seconds on why you think we, um, like how we can keep them to stay into the church. And, and, and after that, just pray for us and go from there. Okay, sure. Um, so I would concede to what Lexine and I think Nana said is vulnerability. I think what vulnerability does is that it bridges the gap um, and it mm. forms connectivity. It forms a beautiful connection between the older generation and the younger generation. Another thing that I've seen in my life is um, community. Community is so big. It's so huge. And so when you have brothers and sisters, the right pastors, mentors, leaders um, that are able to just pour into you, change can really happen. And so... Yeah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. So you could um, go. Well, you know what? Since you said Pastor Richard, give us a UK accent prayer and we'll be we'll be off like that. <laughs> in, in it, right? Let's humbly pray. Our Father, we are so grateful unto you that you have opened up this discussion for us to have and approach and confront this elephant in the room. We are grateful that you, O oh God, brought our mothers and fathers Father, we have become a product of grace as a result of their labor. Father, we're having this conversation because it's a burden on our hearts. We pray, O oh God, that our zeal will produce results. Praying, O oh God, bringing this book before you, O oh God. It is the reason why this book has come at this particular time. Pray that it will bring resolution, O oh God, into this conversation. The Lord, it would keep and maintain people, would reduce the attrition, O oh God that our young people will be sustained and make sustainable churches as a result of this, O oh God. Pray, O oh God, that you will bless each and every soul that is hearing what we are discussing today, that you, O oh God, will open hearts and bring forth many, many forms of illumination that, O oh God, will cause fruition in this particular conversation with regards to the Diaspora Church. We want to thank you, O oh God, for every panel member that you have used, O oh God, to initiate this conversation, and we pray that there will be much more wisdom on this, that as we continue to have discussions such as this, there will be productivity and fervence of your kingdom ultimately. We want to thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you guys so much. Uh What a powerful conversation. Serious, man. 
Yeah, like that was really good. It was, it, was, it was actually intense. I just can't wait for the the combos that will come out of this. Yes. Really can't wait. And stay yeah. tuned for the podcast. Yeah, African Elephant Podcast. My dream, let me share this with y'all. Mm-hmm. My dream for the podcast, I was talking to my brother about it, was mm-hmm. we have a podcast company and we bring in wow. people who want to just, who have a voice to talk about sports, mm-hmm. about just faith, about, yes. and just have a company, like relationships, wow. not just marriage, but just how to even date, wow. Christian date, even sexuality, like, I think our church has made sex look like it's bad, but it's created yeah. by God, right. you know, it's a culture thing, but we want to break that through these combos, so if you have a voice for podcast, um, hit me up, let's, let's talk. God will raise the money for us to build our own thing Amen. For, our, for this diaspora. Amen. Amen. And it even goes to the partnership that you guys were talking about. Um, but in the chat, we had some great feedback. Um, Victoria Tyron said, this is my exact experience, so I definitely agree. My pastor said that the places that make you the most upset sometimes are the places that you need to be at. True. You know, sometimes you see the problem and you might be called to help bring the solution to it. Correct. Um, Dr. Sanita Ediful said, when you see a problem in a church, it is the Lord giving you an eye to see so you can make that problem your ministry, another perspective. And then um, Teria Frimpong said that, yeah, there is no perfect church. That is why the Bible says that we shall be like him when he appears in his glory. Right now, he was preparing us to be like him. True. Thank you guys for staying connected. Thank you guys for giving us feedback. Um, um, but there is a question that I want to ask. Someone, um, yeah. Angie, she asked, um, one thing that she's been pondering over is that, do you think that some of these pastors don't give platform to the youth because they fear that they will lose their positions? Or do you think it's more of a pride in our African leadership? Word, word. Um, now, I don't, I, it's two things like, Sorry about that. So it's two things, right? Um, of course, if you have insecurity problems as a leader, you might be afraid of something like that. Right. But I don't think that is the main reason. Um, I don't think that's the. I don't think that's the main reason. I think the main reason is um, trust issues. So it's a chapter in my book, and I'm talking about trust issues. Sometimes they may. It's not that they're scared to lose their position. They're scared to lose the tradition. So not position, but tradition of the church. So if I bring a boy who's so American, can he keep the same church tradition? They're afraid of that. So sometimes what people who are afraid do is they bring in people who sound and look like them, maybe dress like them. They could be 20 years old, but think like they're 50, uh, dress like they're 40. You know, so it's not an issue of losing a position. Sometimes churches are losing of, are scared of losing of uh, tradition. Um, so that's what I think it is at times. And I think we see that a lot. You can see a vibrant young man who's on fire for God, but he just acts too American. They say, oh, well, you know, too American. They won't give you any position. And um, when you see somebody who's probably maybe so African, and they're like, yes, he will keep the tradition. He will keep, he will, he will, he will do what we need. And that's what I call trust issues. Um, so it's in the book, man, you know, I talk about, I don't think people are scared of, look, th- everybody knows they're going to die one day. Everybody knows they're going to go, oh, they need to find a succession plan. The issue really is whoever I give it to, can that person be trusted with right. their church culture? Right. But we must understand it should be Christ culture over any other culture. So, Amen. Yeah. Christ culture over any other culture. And thank you guys for staying tuned with us. Coming up next, we have some great people who are coming to give us words. We got, again, Minister Joe Metal. We have Skinny Man giving yeah. us some comedy. So please do not move. And once more, this um, entire production is sponsored in part by Cosmo Portals. So please, if you are on social media, follow them at Cosmo Portals. If you have a business of any sort, they are your IT people. Again, they let you do what you do best and let the engineers handle the rest. Amen. Um, but without further ado, now we want to head over. We want to give the platform to Apostle Yao, um, Apostle Yadom, um, to give us the, the, the real launching of this book and take us to the next level. So Apostle, over to you.
thank you very much. Uh, we are grateful to God for uh, this wonderful peace that is being handed over to us tonight. Um, we're going to share a word of prayer. Much has already been shared about the book and then also um, our panel members using their live experiences to um, speak into the book. And so uh, wherever you are, I invite you to join us in the time of prayer as we pray to uh, bring this book before the Lord for uh, him to breathe upon the book and to make it more inspirational uh, for our edification. Uh, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you so much for this time and season. Yes, your word says that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. And so what we see tonight, we believe was for ordained by your sovereign will and according to your divine purpose. And you prepared your servant, Yao Ose Uusu, by taking him through different experiences to make him ready and to make him fit for this task. We are very much grateful to you, our Lord, our master, savior, Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for the ability granted unto our brother uh, to be able to identify this big elephant, the elephant in the room that somehow has been uh, ignored by so many people. And some also have not been able to identify this elephant but we thank you for the life of the author, the ability granted him to identify this elephant and also the passion to take on the challenge and more so the wisdom to handle the issue in such a way that anybody who will read will be edified. We thank you so much. Now, Father Lord, we bring this book to you May you continue to breathe upon the book to make it more inspired that anybody who would lay hands on this book would have a transformed mind, both old and young. We pray for the spirit of humility. We pray for a designing heart. We pray for open mind, even as we handle this book, the willingness also to apply the solutions suggested in this book in a way that will bring the need that change in your church and in the society at large. We pray in the name of Jesus for both young and old, my Lord and my God, to accept our unique roles in ensuring that people of all age groups would have a place in your church in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, my Lord and my God, that anybody who lay hands on the book will not just consider it as an addition to his or her library, but would take the pains to read and grant such individuals the understanding that is needed to be able to change in our minds and in our hearts. Your church must not suffer loss, for which reason you have inspired your servant to write this book. We pray, oh God, that may you have your own way. And now, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I declare this book officially launched for public consumption. May this be to your glory, and may this be to the edification of your people now and the generations to come. 
in the name of our Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we have launched this book. Amen. Come on and talk to me. Yes, the it's African elephant has been launched. Thank you so much, Apostle Yadom. And now we're going to head over to Elder Joe Opong to give us some remarks. Please remember that if you make a donation tonight of $50 or more, you will get yours personally signed by the author himself. Don't go anywhere. We're going to also talk about interracial marriages in the African church and things of that nature. So listen, we're just getting started. Please stay tuned. Elder Pong, over to you. Lord, I need to talk to you right now. Yeah, yeah. Come on and talk to me. Lord, I need you now. This evening has been phenomenal so far, and we are looking forward to the rest of the program. When our brother Yao reached out and asked if I would be gracious enough to be the chairman of this occasion i really didn't hesitate i have really been impressed with his vision and really his tenacity to bring the kingdom of christ together uh, from his days starting the true worshipers movement to this book that he has written i believe that god has a unique anointing upon him and a unique gifting that he wants to unfold to the church at, at large uh, tonight is really a testament of that um, he reflecting on his thoughts around why young men and women are leaving their churches of birth once they go to college and really why that is happening across um, African churches in the diaspora. And I do think that it's important that this message is really discussed. And I do think that he taking the initiative to write the African elephant um, really symbolizes his desire to make sure that we as the kingdom of God continue to address this issue collectively. And so tonight we're here to celebrate, um, even as he celebrates his birthday and also uh, celebrates the launch of this book. I do feel privileged and I do think that you as well who are tuning on all over the world can attest to the fact that this would be a great night of celebration and also commemoration for what he has begun even in his ministry and where God is going to take him to. Our Savior, Lord, and Jesus Christ indicated to his father that, Lord, all the people that you've given to me, I would in no wise um, cast them out. And I do think that in the Christian um, community, everyone is needed. All our young ones, uh, myself included, play a critical role in our churches. And so we need to make sure that we are being equipped we're being listened to and also we are bringing something to the faith table that will really help move the church um, along. And so tonight, I believe it's the uh, beginning of that journey, even as we launch this book. And so I would encourage you to support, uh, support this luncheon, uh, both with your presence, which we thank you for, but also with your finances. And so if you be kind enough that um, give what you can um, certainly encouraging people if you can give a fifty dollars if you can give a hundred dollars two hundred dollars whatever it is that, that is going to help um, accelerate this movement and make sure that this vision of our brother does not um, kind of go unnoticed or kind of die on the vine and so on behalf of myself and my family we are going to be uh, pledging and making a thousand dollars towards this book launch and also towards this 
a movement where he wants to have a podcast, a podcast around the African elephant where young men and women can come together and dialogue and talk about the things that may be challenges in their local churches and how we can collectively help make uh, or bring a resolution. And so I encourage you to do something um, for him and also for this kind of movement. And so if you'll be kind enough with the instructions on your screen, we would want you to donate and anyone who donates $50 and above, um, our brother Yao will send you a signed copy. And so we would ask that you would put in the memo um, kind of your number or your email address so that he can reach out to you. And so on behalf of myself and also our brother Yao and all the um, kind of collective group of people who have made this night a reality, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity and we look forward to the rest of the program. And so at this point, I would invite our minister, Joe Metal to even give us um, a song ministration, even as we launch into our ability to give and to support. God bless you. God richly bless you. Amen. Hey, y'all, I want to say God bless you. And I bless God for your life, for this new book. I know it's going to be a great blessing to many. And um, I pray that many more shall come. Also, I want to say happy birthday. Thank you for giving me the chance to join you through this together. Yeah. I've come to praise you for your goodness and your kind <laughs> Your faithfulness and love you show to me Cause even when I fall you pick me up Your mercy seven new More, 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 yes, you Christ the Lord Hey, yeah I've come to praise you for your goodness and your kindness Your faithfulness Everybody help us say Say, mama. 
with us wherever you are. <laughs> Everything is working for Charlie. First of all, me person me congratulate you on the new book I was through. Me can kind you know a very little bo. I ma me kai time I me di me hongko joini asori bi. Na asori no so funi ke cancer bi bi a oni ne be kwa ko kani so bi a obi ba be kan. Ena one time bi na ye ye praises and worship ene drew be bi a si a bomb pie no. Inti the only the prayer no eh can ti a drew be bi a si. Your mom pie na nyamin kadi or tifia onye na jin so be bas or no mra. Timi de menia breme bom pie mus a sofuna kwa jim mike no se. Ena mum mom pie so my brother kwa jo so so uko school wa bon a kunya f f f unkwa anti mum mom pie mano. Oh, menia wusi afa so ubi e chicha nenia so mu be heme. Oh, menia wusi sofunu menino kwa kani so u se school no me kwa mi husu nti omo mo mpae ma me no dia be gu mani ma se wa so ho sa oh so funa gu mani ma se one time bi so na ye ye bible studies na no mo po bi ama na read the key version no nti omo po bi na na so funa nka se chu so bi o se michael amitepe kind key version na ma ye 
Oye so o kan o si na ensa no wagai nom de na nse o yire be ka chem se o sori ensa nko a a wo de e be bom paya ma kan ma ye kan ma ye no ogun ani ma se basa oh so funi gugun ko fu ani ma se one time bi so ya pon asori ye ye announcement de e o ma announcement no o kan o se wo e kyena na kwa fu no mo mbra e wa na so fu na kwaje o se mr and mrs ashwaleta mr mr mo mo nko Busia na mi di mani mkoji ya mudi ya wede no ma frame si yeme tu yebi inti mungu yeme me bani akani ye no guo mani maasi aswali na nchi no biya ni pabi bridge ya ma me kwa msumi jai bi you know ni omani keting keti bi si ya ne ma engrofu jai aswali no so huo patu ready ya buku na ni omani be brewum a ube ube related to so huo ni ame chana inti na yeah. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah. First of all, that video was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> now, Skinny is just, I'm telling you, like, my, me and my parents, we could just sit down and just watch Skinny. He's just a very funny guy. Um, but before we continue, I just want to say yes. God bless everybody who gave. No matter what yes. you gave, I believe that it's, it's a blessing. And I just want to say may God bless you, keep you. Um, we'll write more books. We'll do more podcasts. More podcasts, and this is for our community. It's for us. Yes. So thank you so much for being a blessing, and we promise to steward the money to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And for our next conversation, it is um, we we shortened it a bit, you know, for time and for the audience. But our next conversation, it actually features Mr. and Mrs. Ousu Ose Ousu Senior. Well, my mom is in the back, like. Making her talk, comments. Making her comments. That's what she always does at home anyway. So it was between my parents. It was my myself and my two uncles. Okay. Um, Elder William Asibe and Uncle uh, Eddie Cuban, and then my okay. dad. We were talking about, so this was a, uh, it was about their struggle when they came from, um, Ghana. you know, Ghana. Mm -hmm. Chapter one talks about how our parents came here. Um, Ghana their must struggle. go. Ghana must go. <laughs> you know, the struggle. But the combo was kind of long. And then we got to interracial marriages mm. and it just got heated that's when my mom came out and nobody said no you don't marry any white girl. i'm like hey Tommy, i'm already <laughs> married no, chill out you know <laughs> it was it was wild but we wanted you guys to watch it and just be a part of that interracial marriage combo so it just starts out of nowhere and um so because i asked that question and it got there yeah so guys stay tuned the conversation is up lord i need to talk to you right now This is my last question. It's a bonus one. We'll see. Why is it that African parents have an issue when we go and marry outside of our culture? Oh, that's something that I think. I think. I, I think that's a big one. Why is it that? Because it's like in our church, they'll say, "Hey, we want to be multicultural. You want to be multicultural, but if your child also goes to marry a multicultural African American, uh, white or something." Um, why is it sometimes it's it's it's, it's being um, attacked? Because I always say this in my book. I talk about in Ghana. There's only about four, five, six. I'm I'm not sure. Don't quote me on this. But high schools, right? So everybody went to. If you're in the same age group, basically you know the next person from in Ghana. So when you come to America, in Ghana, you marry your own because. That's all you know. But we're in America now. We go to school with Hispanics. We go to school with whites. We go to school with African Americans. Of course, it's possible that we can marry some. But I've noticed that it's a fight. You know, especially in my house. Hey, I know if I brought home a, a, a white girl, oh, maybe she will beat me. She will beat me well. <laughs> you know? So let's talk about that. Like, why? What's the issue? Why? You know, because it's really hurting some uh, millennials. It's really hurting people's feelings. And at a, at a, at a, at a will, I know you have... You, you actually have in-laws that are Caucasian and stuff. So I think yes, that. yes. And it's, uh, the, the, the challenge is that it's a cultural conflict. You know, uh, you know my, my, I know my son was going to get married to a white lady. And uh, you see, they, they know the culture, but they don't understand the culture, okay? Mm. The children don't understand the culture. You want traditional marriage, right? Okay. And then you want to tell me that this were once I want them to attend. 
What are you talking no, about? No, it's true. Me and my yo, me and my parents, we fought by if there was any fights in my in my house, the fight was you want to bring this press? I'm like, yo, but dad, like, let's do it this way. But I say, hey, shut up. No, the tradition. No, <laughs> yes. Oh, no, you know. Yes. And, and, and that is the, 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 the core problem, you know, because you're going to try to tell us something which is not our culture. So we're going to tell them this is our culture. They want to do. So it, it's a very difficult thing when you marry outside your culture. It's very difficult. But why? You but know, is it, is it, but is it difficult for you, the parents, or difficult for your children? I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Do you, yes. Is the issue that you, the, the parents, are not comfortable? Or is it that you, do you feel like we, are, we, we will have a problem? Can you explain what the real issue is? <laughs> okay. Uh, let me tell you my expectation. Then mm -hmm. you understand what the conflict is. Okay. I'm visiting my son and the wife, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then... Um, they, they book a hotel for me to go and stay in a hotel. Okay? Yeah. You see, you have lost it. For me, <laughs> you have lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you've, you've lost it. <laughs> but but that, some hotels are nice. <laughs> as <long> as <laughs> like I want to, I'm visiting, I want the fellowship. Yeah. I want the fellowship. Why am I visiting? I can talk to you from my where I live. I don't have to visit to you if you're going to lock me in a hotel. <laughs> so, 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 so those so, are some of the culture conflicts. Yeah. So, so I guess what I'm hearing from you, right, is that it's and I, I write this in my book. I think, and I could be wrong. You know, I yeah. think that a lot of our parents don't want us to marry outside of our culture, not because. It may hurt us, the ones who are getting to be, going to be married, hurt. but it's hurting you or like there's an inconvenience that it places on you. Am I wrong or am I right? Um, both. You said both. both. You are right and you are wrong. Hey, I'm wrong. My God. You are right in the sense that um, it hurts us because we can't come to you. But why can't you? I don't get it. What, what's this that, idea? No, but what's the idea that you can't come to my house if I'm married? A white girl. Uh, I mean, ah, is that my mom? Is that is that mom? Yeah. I know I heard a voice. Hey, ma. Yeah. This is men talk, please. Men yes. Talk. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, you, you heard what Elder said. Mm -hmm. She was put in the hotel. If there's a, a room in there with even just a, a, a sofa, she can sleep on it. Yeah. Secondly, it hurts you guys because um the rate of divorce. And the things that they use to divorce on is just frenzy. Just little thing, I'm gone. And nobody comes in. You just go and see counselor somewhere and we just uh, get your money and then divorce you guys. <laughs> that, that's not what our culture is. Our culture is before I come in to ask for your daughter, I know my son is going to marry your daughter. Should there be a problem? I will not let the problem progress into divorce. Everybody that was at the, uh, at the marriage is responsible to make sure your marriage progress. Nobody is, is interested in being divorced, allowing you to divorce. But here, it's not like that. That's the main reason why we are so much um, against um, that cultural uh, um, intermarriages. <laughs> intermarriages. Yeah. I mean, I, I so, guess... Okay. I, I, Okay, I'm ready. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. See, so um, what I've noticed is that here in the diaspora, if you're going to marry someone out of your your ethnic tribe, one there's an issue, mm -hmm. right? They say, "Oh, this person is a Dagati or a Nosna. This person is oh a Ga. Oh, this person is a Ewe." There are some some parents that take issue to that. They want you to marry your own tribe. Mm -hmm. Now, translate that. Now you're going to marry a Hispanic or a white. Mm -hmm. Right. The problem with, I mean, some of the other problems, I, I, I agree with what Uncle, uh, Uncle William has said and your dad has said. The other thing, too, is that, oh, so we want to go for vacation back home. We want to see, we're going to see grandma. All of us are going. Now, you have a Caucasian girlfriend or you have a Hispanic girlfriend. You think yeah. she's going to go to, I mean, just thinking of Africa or Ghana is the, oh, it's the jungle and all the people are poor. I'm not sitting on an airplane going over there. 
you know, no, 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 okay, I, I feel like, you know, and I think this is, I like this, we talked about expressing ourselves, but I think the, the notion that a lot of African Americans or let's say other African countries that are maybe outside of Ghana or, or even whites will not appreciate our culture I think it's different because we have to also attribute the fact that globalization is a real thing. Yeah. Now, white people would want the, a traditional marriage. Uh, uh, black people even want a traditional marriage. They want to know our food. Now, because of globalization, we can now show them that Accra, Trasaco, Airport Residential, we can show them beautiful places in Kumasi. So I think there's, a, there's an appreciation of our culture the thing is that I think we have to stop looking at people with just their culture. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's wisdom in making sure that you look at the places people are coming from. But if we are all one in Christ, I think Christ culture comes first. And then if Christ culture comes first, then you learn how to respect that person's individual culture. So that if this is what they do in their culture, then you respect that's what they do. Because I think maybe the issue may be that the, this, my generation may not even uphold our culture that much for them to even care that their girlfriend has to win tomorrow for a funeral or to do that, do that. So I, I think if we don't take care and we keep forcing our kids to marry from Ghana, what happens is that people are now marrying outside of their heart desire and yeah. then it strains the relationship on the parents. And you'll notice that just because of a relationship, parents are no longer friends with their own children. Yes, Dr. Yes. Kayao, I have a question yes, to ask you. Yes, sir. So there's um, this a certain tribe in Nigeria where as soon as you see an elder, right, you have to kneel and, and, and the others, you have to lie prostrate. That's right. Right? Yeah. So yeah. imagine that a Nigerian guy goes to marry a white girl and she meets the, the Nigerian parents, right? Do you? I've never seen any white girl. No, I mean, <laughs> why not? <laughs> see, but that's what I'm saying. Globalization has shown me that a lot of them now do the things because to them, it's if I'm marrying you, I'm marrying your culture. I think the only thing that our parents lose, they're losing the extracurricular things that come with our culture. For instance, if my mom, when I'm married to Portia now, if my mom says, hey, I'm coming home, person left for you. <laughs> I'm coming, I'm coming to see. Portia won't say, oh, ma, no. You know, she'll be like, hey, your mom says she's coming. Let me make the room, and that's it. Let yeah, me go she buy pizza. <laughs> no, but the thing is that, but, but if, if, if I married an African, an African-American girl or a white girl, mm -hmm. maybe she'll be like, ah, why can't your mom give us a week's notice? Maybe so I can prepare. You know, it's just that uh, there's little things that, we lose, but I don't think it's worth losing the relationship with your children Correct. for the little things. Because if a woman really likes you, if a woman really likes you, what she will do is she'll make sure that she accepts your culture. But our culture is, it's not our culture that if your mom says she's coming over in two hours, our culture doesn't say that your mom has to come in two hours. No, culture in life is respect. Anybody will know, say, before I come to somebody's house, I must give prior notice. But we, sometimes we give leniency to the African culture that we're all family. So I think now that we're in America, we have to accept the fact that, or London or Germany, wherever you are, our parents have to come to accept that. We are also bought into the diaspora culture. We are not as Ghanaian as maybe you may want us to be. Exactly. <laughs> no, because let me say, let me use my little brother for instance. Kwame is Kwame. He goes to school with. We were lucky. We were in Virginia. We were ah, Buckman Road was just like Kumasi. There was no difference between Buckman Road and Ashtown. It was all the same. <laughs> Richmond Highway. It was the same thing. So we had more Ghanaians to be around. I went to Pentecost. I went to a church that was more Ghanaian. But Kwame is more a bit more American. His school is more Spanish, more whites. So if Kwame comes to tell my dad that, that I'm marrying a Spanish girl, I wouldn't be surprised. Nor do I think my parents would have to be surprised because he's grown up in a culture. But knowing our culture, we would try to say, no, look at the Ghanaian. And don't get, don't get me wrong, I married a Ghanaian because I like 
I want to make sure I have my fufu, I have my bongo. <laughs> <laughs> like I like, like and then and then me, I feel like I can flow with the Ghanaian more, the kind of work I do. And it, I was just attracted to that. But also, I'm I'm still I'm also a I was I was 18 and listened to Elder Mercury. What 18 year olds were listening to Elder Mercury at that time. So I'm more Ghanaian sometimes than even American. But for somebody like my little brother, what do we do? How do we keep our kids in the church and in the home? What do we do in the church and in the home to keep the ones who are more American because they bought into the diaspora and like because they were born here? Because people are really hurt about this subject. Do we accept them or do we keep fighting? The, the relationship. No, it's not a fight. I think I think mm-hmm. there's a dialogue. There has to be a dialogue, you okay. know, and True. the expectations must be set. Okay. And then we can respect one another. That's all. I mean, you can tell me, you know, how you feel. That's okay. Then I'll also accept what I'm telling you. So, okay. That's true. Look, I will say, okay, y'all, if I'm visiting, please don't put me in the hotel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to be able to tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Regardless whether you live in one bedroom or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I no, want I, to I, have the feeling and have conversations and enjoy the fellowship. You know, yeah. in fact, we went to Ghana uh, yeah. last August, okay? All my children and their friends. And and believe me, when we went to my village, Kokofu, you know, those of you who come from Ashanti, Kokofu is a typical place. And and you know, we you know, the corn, I give them the corn that they are boiling and all that. And we have to eat it. Nothing uh, there's not gonna be hamburger in this place. <laughs> you got to eat it. And if you are willing to do that, you enjoy it. In fact, they enjoyed it. They did enjoy it. They enjoyed Kumasi very well, you know, and um they enjoy our crowd also very well in Tishi. We're in Tishi. My wife is from Tishi. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they enjoy Tishi and eat uh, kinky. You see, that's all we want. We want you to feel comfortable. Let us mm-hmm. also feel comfortable. That's all. Okay. Okay. So I guess the last question will be this on this subject. And that uh, you can answer this. Do you feel like the uh, our parents, uh, our pastors, our elders, all those people, do you feel like we have adopted the Christ-like nature when it comes to interracial marriages and relationships, can we truthfully say that we've adapted the Christ-like nature in accepting this thing that maybe our kids... Now, Pastor Will, I I mean, uh, Elder Will, I think it's easy for you because your children, you've accepted it and you you live with them. So I guess the question is to my dad and my mom in the corner there who is talking in the corner (laughs) and... and, and uh, Uncle Eddie, what do you think? Do you feel like we've adapted? Because the thing is this, we are, we, were, we are saying that our children are now supposed to build the African church that will become no longer African. It will be just the church in America. Right. But how can we do that if we only accept them marrying their own? And Because the messages we are hearing is kind of, Hey, Mario, not like one from the pulpit, but let's say just to coach and what we say. So, Dad, do, what do you think about that? Do you think we are, we are, we are doing a good job making our kids feel that they can marry anybody they can, um, as long as they love Christ, if, as long as they love God? What do you think, Dad? Uh, how do you know somebody loves God? Yeah, it's by their fruits. They come to repentance. Yeah. Uh, repentance. Um, I think. We are at crossroads. Um, it's not easy letting them go that way, knowing that where they are going, the possibility of having bigger issues at the, in the middle of their marriage or getting to the end or somewhere without anybody coming in to... Dad, I don't mean to cut you off, but why do you think there will be bigger issues? Can you explain that? Why do you think there could be issues that crop up? <sighs> <laughs> it's really very difficult to talk about it that way. But I think I think the way divorce is handled mm. yeah, in the American system, British system, mm. is not encouraging. Okay. I say encouraging because um the parents do not have any say in it at all mm. with the American level. But with us, um the, the way that we, we marry, right. everybody becomes part of it. Okay. And people talk 
Yeah. Let, let, if I have a little time, let me tell you what happened. Oh. Uh, at my workplace, there was a girl I never asked about the, the husband, but I know that she's married with kids. Mm. So one day I just went to her desk and I, it prompted me to ask about the husband. So how's your husband doing? Patrick, by tomorrow, she's not going to be my husband. <laughs> why they are growing apart that I use the word of God to talk to them and my experience in marriage and I talk to them I talk to him hey, not not a man so I did that for one week then one day she came back to me and said Patrick we are back together we are going to go on vacation together oh hallelujah but this is what this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's, it's very well, difficult to bring is. people back to marriage. Okay. They always talk to them to go out because uh, your husband cheated you, cheated on you, or something. Yeah, I, I see. I see. I, I guess. I guess. I, to me, I think it, it's all circumstantial. It depends on what who you marry, what kind of Christian home they come from, and understanding of even biblical marriage. But I, I see what you mean, and I respect that. That um, Because time is far gone, I think you've done a good uh, job uh, with this. Uh, yeah. Hey, mom, please. Hey, that's hey, all okay, 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 mom, please come on the thing. I think you, you want to say something here. <laughs> you want to say something? Are you, this one is going well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, yeah. uh, uh, oh, so everybody can listen to it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> then I can share this. There was okay. something that I wanted to. Okay. I know, say, yeah, you were here. You, you know what went on in our family. I'm not going to mention a name because people are listening. Okay. No. Know that. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you were not your daddy. That that was here yeah, that time. Can you know what would happen to this marriage? Yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. You know, if, I, it, if it were, uh, if it were, uh, the other side is uh, like a white lady or black guy or a, a black American okay, who would come in. Uh, mommy, please, I don't want no problems. I think, I think. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm bringing you. I'm drawing your attention to this issue. Well, as for them, nobody will come in and say, oh. That's why yeah. this marriage will work. <laughs> this marriage, there was no encouragement. So yeah, that's yeah. why we always trying to uh, tell you to get your own. Yeah. But yeah. there's the Ghanaians there. Why don't you pick one? <laughs> 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 yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I, I really want to say this quickly. Yes. So in as, in as much as in the Christian, I mean, in the church, right, mm. the, the, the other churches are... Uh, uh, they embrace, you know, an African, I mean, coming in the church, getting married to one of the girls. Yeah. Now, we have that issue in, a, in, in as much as we decry racism, that whites are racist against us, this is racist against us. Now, look at who is beginning to become racist. Oh, and it's us when it yes. comes to our children getting married to others. And yeah. in, in the Christian circles, that has to change because a Christian is a Christian no matter the, the color, red, blue, yellow, green, white. Yes, I, man of God, God bless you. And I think that's why I stand. You know, I, I can never disobey my dad. So I love my dad. I have to say, sir, I agree. <laughs> but, but no, I, I think what I want to drive home for you all watching today is also that. You know, it's not who you marry that changes your, your character. It is Christ that changes character. character. Through, his, through his spirit. And you know, like, I'll tell you, look, when I was growing up out of the world, William, right? When I grew up, my mom always painted this picture of like, no offense, but like Ghanaian girls too. I used to think, because growing up, right, we grew up around a lot of African Americans. So school was a lot of African. I lived on the, like say, the good part of the highway. So I wasn't around the Ghanaians. We would have to go there on weekends to be around them. So growing up in school, I realized that, you know, I knew just really African Americans. And then we'll go to church, we we'll see our Ghanaian friends. But the way my mom used to express how Ghanaian men and women are, the, you would think, said like, after Virgin Mary, it's like our own people are next, like, after her. <laughs> so, so, so it wasn't until, it wasn't until, like, college that I was 
I was really around a lot of Ghanaians, like even Pentecost, like stuff like that. Then I was realizing that, man, you know, we're all the same, bro. Like, it's like, <laughs> we're really, I could be bad. My friend, like, and it's crazy. That's why my generation would say, let's stop comparing because say, 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 be like y'all. Y'all was the one that is singing. And the daughter's probably like, I do know what y'all does over this time. And then they'll say, be like Kofi, because Kofi, uh, but do you know what Kofi does? Because to be honest, I think we have this idea that we as Ghanaians and Nigerians and uh, just Africans, yes, I do believe that our culture has helped us. Yes. Like, let's be honest. If it wasn't for our culture, I think we'd even be even really, really bad. But I think that there's this idea that our culture is enough to save. Look, people, if it, like, I grew up and I noticed that all the time when I got to, like, Portia, like, when I got to, like, high school, I would notice that a lot of aunties will be bringing their children they had in Ghana, like, later. So we'll see a new kid will come to youth class. And I'd be like, hey, who's your mom? He'd be like, oh, auntie... Uh, so and so, and I'm like, I just saw so only she don't got no old kids. She only has a small kid, and then he be like, and then nobody can really tell the story because if you tell the story, <laughs> you'll find out that auntie, when she was young, she was doing some things. But this was frequent. We would always see a new kid that was our age joining us in youth class, and I'm like, where did you come from? They be like, oh, my mom is so and so, or my dad is so and so. I'm like, no, bro, we've known the kids that grew up in America. I don't know you, <laughs> you know. Then when I grew up and I realized that, hey, even auntie was bad when she was 16. <laughs> auntie was bad when she was 18. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's some, so I realized that when people have children out of wedlock, people uh, losing their virginity before marriage, Ghanaians are also doing the same. So the, the thing becomes, it is not culture that changes us. It is Christ that makes that. You, you said it yourself that, look, my dad is my, my dad is my example. That my dad is my hero. I think my brother told me one day, he said, hey, bro, you know that you know, my dad already shared this. He said, oh, dad stepped out on mom uh, when she was in Ghana, he was in London. I was like, hey, my dad? No way. <laughs> no, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was shocked. I was very shocked. But then, but my dad told me, he said, I wasn't a Christian back then. And it makes sense because, Without Christ, we can't be. Yeah, you can't, you can't change. Can't change. Yeah. So, even so I, sometimes, mm-hmm. even sometimes Christians even fall. You we remember do. the question? You, you remember the time that you asked me, Uncle Eddie, but I thought you were a virgin, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, <laughs> you, you remember Carlos? You remember <laughs> <laughs> even sometimes yeah. Christians fall. You know? Yeah, we and fall. It, it's true. So, so the, my point is that I think we have to, this idea of, Oh, when they divorce, people can, oh, things can happen. Look, it can happen anyway. Yes, I do believe our system of marriage makes it harder for us to complete the divorce process. But mm. people still divorce as Ghanaians. What will yeah. save people from divorcing is if Christ becomes the foundation. Yeah. And I think we end up doing more damage when we teach people that only, look, it's wisdom. It is wisdom. If you, as long if you're Ghanaian, very Ghanaian, very Nigerian, it's probably smart to marry somebody that would understand you. But we have to also understand as parents that we're growing up in a culture that me, I don't even know how to speak to you. I understand it, but I can't speak it. So it wouldn't be an issue if I married a white person because I wouldn't be speaking a language or an accent she wouldn't understand. We all went to high school together. Our culture is the same. What we have to admit is that it won't really hurt us. It may really only hurt the extended family, but we should be okay. If we raise our children in Christ, we should want to be able to make the right decision in who we marry. Two, we should live together in Christian principles and values and Christ will be exalted. Then truly that will be one of the ways the African elephant will just become an elephant instead of just an African church because our churches, they came to build, look, Trinity Baptist, GICC Pentecost, right? If it remains the same after 20 years to come, then we've also failed our next generation. Yeah. We've also failed you guys. If you put us in leadership and we're just bringing the same people. But I think marriage is going to be one of the ways we'll see different things. Um, evangelism will be also other ways we sit. The question now becomes, will our parents be acceptable of these things. Time is up. We know we have hey. a good time. <laughs> hey, man, please. <laughs> time is up. Time is up. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, my mom is wild, guys. That's how my mom is. Okay. So please, we, we have chapters in this book that talk about this. But I want to thank my guest, Elder Willie. I want to thank my dad. I want to thank Uncle Eddie. I want to thank my mom, who also added her voice sometimes. <laughs> And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk more. We'll do more of these discussions at other times. May God bless you all, and then uh, stay tuned. Amen. Lord, I need to talk to you right now. Yeah, yeah. Come on and talk to me. Lord, I need you now. Y'all, I think that. W- Every African family probably has to have that conversation. Like, Yao's mom is a whole vibe. And I know that, it, interestingly enough, I feel like a lot of our parents probably have similar sentiments. Um, but we will be posting the full video. So please stay on the lookout. Again, thank you guys for vibing with us. Thank you for dropping your fire emojis in the chat, for being interactive. Please remember that if you're posting any videos, any pictures, use hashtag the African elephant and tag at Yao underscore Wusu. And without further ado, we are about to cut this this cake, y'all. I wish y'all were here to have some, but I'm going to eat some on behalf of you, okay? Um, but over to you, Mrs. Oseosu. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. We really, really appreciate you all tuning in, joining, and just enjoying this entire time with us. Um, so first, we're going to do a little toast. Um, so here you go, Lindsay. Thank you. I will get you right there. Thank you. Um, So I just want to start off by making a quick toast to my husband um, on this achievement. I'm very, very proud of you. And I know that this is the beginning of greater things to come. Also a happy, (laughs) happy, happy birthday to you um, today. Um, We thank God for adding another year to your life. We know that there are greater things to come. And I pray that the Lord will continue to lead you and guide you in everything that you do. May he bless you with more wisdom, more knowledge. May he continue to make you a great leader amen. and continue to elevate you today and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So now let's toast. This is apple cider, y'all. Y'all's favorite drink. <laughs> so let's take a quick toast in the name of the Father, the, the Son, Son, and, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. amen. Toast, toast. Cheers, 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 cheers. Okay. All right. And now we are going to cut this cake. Um, So as we all know, like we said, today is also Yao's birthday, but we wanted to celebrate his first official book as well. So we have a beautiful cake here with the book cover on it. So um, first, we're going to have you blow out the candles. We know that we covered it. Do we sing happy birthday? Do you want happy birthday? We should sing happy birthday. Let's sing. Uh, let's I sing. think they want to hear happy gonna birthday. Lindsay's going to sing for us. I'm just going <coughs> to sing. All right, happy, ready? happy, happy. <laughs> happy <laughs> birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Yes. Happy birthday, dear Yao. Happy birthday to you. Amen. 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 May God bless you. All right, let's cut this cake. Yes. Mm-hmm. Think well or wish well. Your wish prayer. Maybe next year you have two books. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, so my wish, I'm going to make it, I like to make my wishes public. public. Wow. So African Elephant Podcast will be similar to the level and status of the Breakfast Club. Amen. Amen. And then, awesome, even better. Amen. And then I pray for all of you guys that you all will do what God has told you to do. Don't let nobody stop you. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let nobody look down upon your age. But just listen to the voice of God. And if he said it, have the faith to move. Amen. 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 Woo-hoo! All right, let's cut this cake. Oh, do I have it? Okay. Mm-hmm. In the name of the Father, Father. the Son, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's official. Yes. Happy, happy birthday, baby. Love you. DJ, give us some tunes. All right. All right, before we start dancing too much, we just want to give y'all an opportunity to give us a few closing remarks and also a closing prayer, and then we'll wrap it up with some tunes from our favorite DJ, Mr. DJ Earthquake. 
And yes, but before y'all give the closing remarks, again, shout out to Cosmo Portals. Cosmo Portals. They did their thing. Please flood them on Instagram. Thank them. You know, holler at them. If you have a business, they do IT management services 24-7. They have you covered. Thank you, Cosmo Portals. Yeah, um, I just want to say thank you um, to you guys. Um, sometimes I look at who I am. A lot of people ask questions like, how do you do this? How can you? And it's literally because you guys always support. Um, when I want to give up, I kind of get a text message. I get a message, and they're like, yo, keep it up. God bless you. I think this birthday was kind of touching to me because a lot of people kept saying, blessing to the generation. And I, and I received those with all humility, only by the grace of God. But it also puts a certain type of burden and weight on me. And I'm just like, man. But I, but I keep saying that if God is the one that's placed me at a level like this, um, and there's more to even go, but just this small level, I just think that it's, it's really you guys who believed in what God has placed in me. So everybody watching, you could have been doing something else, but I want to thank you for watching everybody. And my prayer is that as I am celebrating, may celebration always remain in your house in the name of Jesus. May you never lack a thing. I pray may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. And I also want to pray for my people that no matter how much you messed up, Christ died for what you did and what you're going to do. But he also gave you the power to remain holy and righteous for him. So I want to pray that don't let any mistake define you but be defined by the blood of Christ and keep moving. You can write a book. You can do a podcast. You can do have a true worshiper. So you can do everything that I'm doing and even more. You must do more. So thank you. I want to thank my parents. You saw how my mom and dad are. They, that's just how we live in the crib. Very transparent, very wild, and very cool. God bless you to my parents. Um, when I was about 17, 16, they allowed me to go to the Church of Pentecost because they saw that I was growing. A lot of people used to tell my dad that, why are you letting your son go to a church as you're an elder for another church? And my dad said, as long as my son is growing, I'm going to allow him to do what he wants to do because he's grown in Christ. To be honest, Dad, thank you for going through the embarrassment. Mom, thank you for going through the embarrassment, going to church. People are like, eh, they let his son go there, go there. But I believe that I hope by the grace of God, I have more to do, but I've made you proud. And I want to I wanna, uh, pray that the decision that you made to release me, even before 18, I think the Lord has done so much. So thank you. And I want to thank all the panelists, everybody who came, um, to, who just was ready to jump into this. Thanks. You guys made the conversation very fun. Um, God bless you all. I want to thank my chairman, Elder Joe. I called him just three days. I didn't know how to do a book launch. And they said, you need a chairman. I said, chairman, okay. And I called him, and he was ready. Thank you for your support. Man of God, I know $1,000 is not easy to give out in a pandemic or in life. I pray that may the Lord bless you. And I want to pray that may the Lord bless everybody who gave. $5 ain't easy to give in a pandemic. You guys can see how much gas costs per gallon. Ain't a joke. So I understand. <laughs> now it's not, it's not an easy thing. May the Lord replenish you guys. And I pray that it, those who are st still want to give, may the Lord bless you as well. And then Apostle Yadam, thank you so much for praying for the book. I know this book is a tricky book, but you stood out for me, for your love. You showed your face. You showed your prayer. And, and, and I thank you for releasing this book, and I pray that it will be a blessing to all gener generations. Amen. Cosmo Portals, thank you. You believed in this, and you said you would help put this together. Yeah, yeah, everybody, God bless you so much. And Firm Images, thank you so much for coming down and putting this together as, as well. And Light Studios Company as well, thank you. They're in Beltsville, Maryland. They're doing amazing. May God bless them as well. And then to my wife. Yes. Charlie, this book is controversial. Like a lot of people are like, hey, this is it. And sometimes I want to speak my mind and just say, I don't like how the church, and my wife was like, hey, <laughs> chill out, bro. Like, this is how you should say it. And I think it's a blessing. I was telling Pastor Samuel Boy that I like the fact that my wife makes me look good, sound good, and be good. I think she has this element of wisdom I just thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for giving me the tips on how to write. 
and sticking with me. I know that some people may blast me after the book will happen. Thank you for sticking with me as well and through the thick and thin, right? So, and then my in-laws, may God bless you for creating such a wisdom wife. May the Lord bless you as well. Again, may God bless everybody. Amen. And let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight. We thank you for this book. Thank you, O Lord, for the faith and the courage, the wisdom, the inspiration to write this book. Father, I know it will bless all generations, and I pray that as I wrote this under your inspiration, may your spirit speak to hearts while they read this. I pray in the name of Jesus for everybody involved in planning this launching because they put their time into this, Lord. May you bless them. I pray, oh God, for everybody watching. I pray in the name of Jesus. May ideas come out right now in the name of Jesus. May people come out of the shell, come out of fear, and begin to do the things that they were afraid to do. I pray that every idea that was locked in 2020, I pray that 2021, may people begin to move on these ideas. May young people buy homes. May young people write books. May young people get into high levels of places, status. May young people buy studios as we're in light source studio i pray may other people have courage money the finances the support to buy their own studios to buy the look i pray for africans who are afraid to jump into the arts because they were pushed into medicine law engineering i pray may you have the courage to do the arts and may you succeed in it that the whole world will see that anybody who does what the law calls them to do will succeed i pray for my mother and dad's generation, I use them as my mom and dad's a point of contact. May this book, oh God, be a blessing to them. Even as Caleb was old, the Bible says that he was the one that was able to get into the promised land. For he had a different spirit. I pray for anybody that thinks that they're in a different country and then they've reached a certain age, they can't accomplish anything. May they have the faith. May they have the ability to go forth and still accomplish greatness in another country at an old age. May they have a different spirit. And I speak to my generation again. May they have humility, respect. May they have wisdom to carry out the things our parents wanted to do but probably couldn't do. May we have the power to do it and do more. May we make the generation that will come even after us proud. And may we be examples to the whole world. Father, we thank you and we bless you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. DJ Earthquake, let's go.
Thank you so much for joining us for today's production. We hope you enjoyed every bit of it. For more inquiries, please go to firmimages.com where you'll be able to reach out to us and to follow us on Instagram, it is at firmimages. Once again, thank you all and we hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Lord, I need to talk to you right now. Yeah, yeah. Come on, talk to me.
So my body don't lose God, can I walk on my door, yeah. Everybody sing it, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody sing it, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make me sing, oh. Oh, yeah. I say, help me sing, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Holy, your baba. Get it back, get it back.
you must to receive yo Ali back to where you face yo you got must the with yo Oh, oh, oh. See, I'm an overcome. 
coming. Listen, no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. For the greater one lives in me, yes, he does, yes. It's sweating good more. See, I'm an overcomer. I say, yes, sweating good to me, Baba. Lord, I say, for your love, I'm great. Oh, yes, you love me plenty. You came to die for me. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, I am there I am. Ooh, oh, yeah. I searched around. There's no one else like you. Like you love Judah. You're the man, the man, the man. is always the follow yeah.
double, double, heavenly blessings that he might receive. Ah, yeah. God, the grace and mercy is always to follow me.